When I was young, I grew up on the outskirts of a small town in the Midwest, close to the Great Lakes. The town had a population of about 8,000 at the time and was established in 1833. We lived well outside of town, in an area that was mostly either forest or farmland. There was a small trailer park fairly close on the other side of the railroad tracks, built on a sort of raised mound, so high that you couldn't even see the trailer park from the second floor of our house. But to give you an idea of just how remote we were, the half of a mile stretch in the other direction only had three other houses total, and only on one side of the road as well. After that, there was a two and a half stretch of pretty much nothing but trees or crops before you reached the town proper. At that time, I would have called the farmhouse that we lived in a mansion, but I was very small. We lived there for about five years, moving in at about the time that I just entered kindergarten. In retrospect, and looking at it on Google Street View now, it was a fairly small farmhouse, probably built in the early 1900s. While this isn't directly related to the events that I'll later tell you, it occurs to me that it might be relevant, so I'm going to include it. So we owned six acres of land, and... Even then I knew I was fortunate to have so much room to explore and play in. The property was much longer than it was wide too. The house sat fairly close to the road and the mass of the land that had been cleared I now assumed to be used as farmland for crops. There was also a ring of trees around the perimeter and a well-worn walking path adjacent to that ring of trees. Outside of a very small grove of apple trees directly next to the house, towards the front of the property, the rest of the land was an empty field full of just tall weeds. So, while I spent most of my time playing in and exploring the closest half of the property, I would never really go back in the back acres alone. The stretch of the trees to the north didn't bother me, nor did the patch of trees and thick forest to the northwest. The patch to the southwest, however, for whatever reason, just terrified me. I would never go anywhere near it alone, and... Even if I ventured that far with friends or adults, it made me extremely uncomfortable being near that forested sort of corner there. I occasionally still have nightmares about that patch and for whatever reason, it just freaked me out. Closer to the house, right at the start of the path to the back acres, was a massive wood pile that I spent a good deal of my time playing in. It was easily five feet tall, if not six feet, as tall as, if not taller than an adult, and I'm pretty sure larger than our house as well. It was composed of irregular shaped planks that were made by cutting the slightly rounded edges off of a tree. I'm no woodcutter by any means, nor do I know the process, but it always hit me as odd that that much timber was just left behind like that. While the planks were too rounded and irregular in shape to be used for construction, that much I could see. It seemed like a lot of timber that could have been ground up to make particle board or something. I assumed the wood pile was the byproduct of clearing the land for farmland or whatever. Again, I'm no woodcutter, but I will mention that there were no tree trucks to be seen, nor were there any stumps left in the wood pile. They obviously must have been pulled up in the clearing process, but no idea what happened to them or why they were hauled off while the irregular planks were left to rot like that. I can only assume that this mini sort of logging operation had happened a number of years before, probably even decades. The planks were extremely old, whatever the case, and weathered from the elements and very, very brittle. Even though many had sections as thick as 2x4s, they were prone to breaking under the weight of my small frame, and if I put my mind to it, I was capable of breaking them in half with my 5-10 to 10 year old strength. Now, I only bring all of this up to establish that the land was not being used for what it was intended to be. In fact, pulling it up on Google Maps, to this day, those six acres are still not used for farming, even though nearly all of the surrounding plots now are. The house, though, was completely square. On the bottom floor, half was divided between a dining room and a front room. The other half split between a master bedroom, with remaining space divided between the kitchen and the two flights of stairs. 
one of which led down to an entryway, which included another flight of stairs down to the basement, and the other leading upstairs. I don't think it was ever remodeled. I think the upstairs was designed to basically be a livable attic. You went up half a flight of stairs to a small landing, then had to turn 180 degrees to another half a flight of stairs that led up to a sort of long alcove. From the alcove, you had two doors on either side, one to a small bedroom and one to a slightly large L-shaped bedroom. Both bedrooms were equipped with two insanely large walk-in closet storage areas. They sloped due to the roof, but they were large enough that my older brother used one as his bedroom, so he had enough space for couches in his bedroom, proper to hang out with his friends and all that. The slightly larger bedroom, that eventually became mine, was large enough to fit two double beds in comfortably, plus a large chest of drawers and plenty of floor space to play in. Closets are scary when you're a kid, large ones even more so. Mine was large enough to fit every conceivable monster my mind could imagine in it. More than enough room for Dracula, a wolfman, the boogeyman, and plenty of room for a Bigfoot or two. My parents, they weren't much for the molly coddling, and I was expected to go to bed by myself every night. Now, there was a small window on the stairway landing that allowed some light from the yard security light, but when you made that 180 turn, you were staring at a flight of stairs leading up to the pitch darkness where the next light switch could be found. I'm not too proud to admit it, but most nights I made that ascent crying in fear. I also have a large family, but my siblings were all much older and every year saw another one striking out on their own and a number of those of us dwelling there getting consistently smaller. One might come back to visit or stay briefly when times were tough, but... We went from like six when we first moved in to eventually two to four. My father traveled for work and my older teenager brother spent most of his time out running around. So by the time that I was nine, most nights it was just me and my mum. Putting this as politely as I can as well, my closest brother was much older than me, a high school jock and, well, kind of an idiot. Even for brothers, I can't say our relationship was good at that point. Most of our interactions went between him ignoring me to tormenting me for his own amusement. I tended to avoid him as much as possible because our time spent together was never enjoyable and usually ended with me crying and my mum screaming, leave your brother alone. Now, honestly, I still have almost no idea when this happened. I couldn't tell you what season and only slightly comfortable in guessing it was probably about the time I was eight, maybe barely after I turned nine years old. The only thing that I can say for certain is that my father was away on business at the time and while I'd shared my bedroom with my older sister for the first few years, she'd moved out and I had the bedroom to myself. Now, old houses creak, but they creak and moan as they settle. Most nights I'd lay in bed terrified, listening to these sounds trying to convince myself that it wasn't a monster coming to get me. Eventually a train would pass by and the motion of it shaking the house would always put me to sleep, which is a bit weird, right? So I assume it was a night like any other. If I'd seen a scary movie or read a horror story, I would walk up the stairs in fear and lay in bed listening to every small noise, wondering what it was until a train rocked me to sleep. Barring a nightmare, I almost never woke up in the middle of the night, usually sleeping until the sun came up or my mum woke me up, whichever came first. I didn't have an alarm clock and I have no memory of there ever being a clock in that room. Total stab in the dark, but sometime after midnight, I was awoken to a sound outside of my bedroom door in that little alcove that I'd mentioned before. I'd have to say that I was a fairly sound sleeper back then because I don't ever remember being woken up by my brother coming home or any other sound for that matter. But for whatever reason, this time I was woken up by a very slow, very long creak of the floorboards. The first immediate thought was that it was the house settling and I turned over to go back to sleep, but this time it didn't stop. There were no sound of footsteps, and each creak just sort of took forever. 
I wasn't actually scared at first, just sort of curious, trying to figure out what it was. But then there was way more noise than the house would make. But if it was someone out there, they were moving just insanely slow. No sound of footfall. If there was someone, they'd just about have to be barefooted or in socks maybe. Just the slow sound of one floorboard groaning in protest of pressure, followed painfully slowly by another floorboard groaning in relief as pressure was removed. At that, I sat up in bed, just listening and arguing with myself. Something has to be there. There's no way anyone is there though. It must be the house making noises. It was so slow that it wasn't even scaring me, I guess. I was just listening to it intently. It went on forever as well. Easily 20 or more minutes. Long enough that eventually I was convinced that it sounded nothing like maybe my brother creeping home late and trying not to wake anyone up or even someone breaking in and trying to steal things in the dark without making a sound. It seemed very much like the sound of something though pacing very slowly, back and forth directly in front of my door. The noise would very slowly move left for a while, and then oh so slowly move back in the opposite direction, like it had no destination in mind. Eventually I was convinced, okay, this is absolutely not my imagination, someone has to be there, and I suspected my brother was trying to scare me or whatever. I went to call his name and found my voice frozen in my throat. My mother was sleeping directly below me and could absolutely hear me if I screamed. And if it was my brother pranking me, yelling would put, yelling would definitely put an end to it. But I don't know, I, I've just never felt such terror in my life at just the thought of yelling. At that age, yelling chases everything bad away and brings your mother to your rescue. But all I felt was pure dread at the thought of releasing a scream. And then, then I heard the sound of the doorknob moving. And any doubt that I wasn't alone was immediately erased. I dove under the covers and balled myself up. Just like the creaking, the sound at the door was painfully slow. Like a three-year-old trying to open a door, unable to get a good grip. I could hear it turning slightly, then stopping, an attempt at turning and then release again, just forever as well. I had a mental image of my brother in a sheet trying to scare me, but even at the time, it just seemed so weird. I mean, why was he doing it anyway? Like, I could see him pretending a few minutes, wandering in the alcove, moaning like a ghost at the top of his lungs until he was sure that I was awake then jumping on the bed to make me cry and laugh at me. But this style of dramatics seemed unnecessary and really unlike him. After easily a dozen clumsy attempts, the doorknob was finally turned enough to open the door, just barely. I could now hear the door barely moving away from the frame, not nearly far enough for anything to fit through. And now came the sound of something pushing on the door without enough force to open it. The door would sort of creak slightly, open a bit, then fall backwards to a near closed position over and over again. And like everything else up to this point, whatever it was, it took forever. Me shaking under the blanket the whole time, mind you. Even allowing for a child's perception of time, I can say with confidence that we were at easily the 30 minute mark at this point, probably much, much longer. Minimum of 30 minutes from the first time that I heard the creaking of the floorboards outside of my room to the time that the door was finally pushed with enough force to finally swing completely open. And that was when the groaning started. Let me stress that this was not the high pitched, ooh, sort of stereotypical look at me pretending to be a ghost moaning sound. This was sporadic, an elderly person trying to get out of bed sort of groaning. When the door opened, I was expecting or hoping for the grand finale of my brother running around, making ghost noises at the top of his lungs. But 
What I got was a continuation of the slow creeping on floorboards towards my bed, now accompanied by what I can only describe as a, a low groan. Like everything else so far as well, it was insanely stretched out and was just painful waiting for what was going to happen next. By this point, I was completely balled into the fetal position, trying my best not even to cry or breathe, terrified to make even the slightest sound. Spoiler too, this went on for hours. I'm finally aware time moves slower for kids, but this would extend until just shy of dawn. So even if it started as late as 3 in the morning during the summer, when nights are shortest, and I'm pretty sure it didn't happen in the summer, I don't remember feeling overheated under the blankets or anything. We're still looking at at least two or three hours minimum. In any case, the entity, or whatever it was, circles the bed in what felt like forever, and somewhere I guess about an hour in, it began touching me. I could feel a, a barely there brush that would eventually really slowly become a very light poke. At this point, I was absolutely petrified. I lay there feeling this for an hour at least. And somewhere before dawn, all of a sudden, everything just stopped. While I allow for my eventually falling asleep, I just cannot imagine sleep taking me when I was so frozen with fear and quivering violently. And I don't remember falling asleep either. Whatever it was, it just stopped. The touching and poking came at a snail's pace and when I went five minutes without being touched, it honestly felt like it was just looming over me. I never did hear the sound of leaving. No slow departure, no creaking of floorboards, nothing. It just stopped. I waited until the room was completely illuminated, not even feeling safe to come out from under the covers when I could tell the sun was breaking, and scrambled down the stairs as quickly as I could to tell my mom exactly what happened. I'm fairly certain that it was a Sunday morning when this happened as well. Didn't have to go to school that day and wasn't worried about watching cartoons or whatever, and started babbling to my mom about seeing a ghost. She was irritated, she didn't get a lot of days to sleep in, and wasn't willing to give up her extra sleep for my imagination. She wasn't interested in hearing about it, so I caught a few hours of sleep in her bed with her at that point. For years, I'd tell all of my friends about the night that I saw a ghost, but as I got older, I realized that it was probably just my older brother playing a trick on me. Now, my brother is still a bit of a jerk, and that's just his way, I guess. When I reached adulthood, we got closer and formed a much stronger bond. He's certainly got his own way of doing things, but he tried to be a big better brother after I hit my teens than he'd ever did when I was a kid. But he still revels in the various pranks that he pulled on me. He very frequently feels a need to remind me that at one point he held all the cards. If I playfully or sometimes resentfully bring up some of the terrible things that he did, he'll gloat about it with a big grin, as if remembering better days. So, one holiday when I'd hit my 30s, I stayed late after the family dinner, and it was just the two of us drinking coffee and talking. He, as always, brought up something that he did to me when I was young, tricking me into eating dog food when I was three, I think, making me lick a 9-volt battery, tricking me into thinking on accident meant intentionally, so it was harder to snitch on him. Take your pick. It's a bit of a long list, but I realized that we'd never talked about what happened that night, so I threw out dressing up as a ghost to scare me that night, and he countered with, what? I figured that this had to be the biggest jewel in his pranks to crown after all. Without a doubt, it was the most elaborate and time-intensive trick that he'd ever pulled off on me, and I figured that he'd laugh heartily and brag about how scared he got me. You know, and gave him details to jog his memory. But he then said, I never did that. Now, considering he remembers every terrible thing that he had done to me, and when he was like 8, 10, or 12 years old... I cannot imagine something this big just slipping his mind like that. 
like I said too, it just never seemed like it was his style or anything as well. He wasn't big on subtlety, I guess, but way more of the quick scare type, make you cry and laugh in your face type sort of thing, usually very low effort for a, a quick payout. I don't think he forgot at all. I have no reason to believe that he's lying. I'm not admitting that it's not his style at all, but I really don't think it was him in the end. Which begs the question, if it wasn't him, then what on earth happened that night? This past year, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. There was about 600 miles of trail that I hiked or camped alone. One of these sections I was alone was in Northern California, slightly north of Shasta. I got to a beautiful spot and knew that it was the best spot to set up camp. It was gorgeous too. 360 views of woods in the valley below and mountains everywhere. I could see it raining on Mount Shasta at that point, probably my favorite campsite in North Cal. I still remember the exact mile and have some footage of the site during the daylight too. But I set up my camp and after admiring the sunset, I went to bed. I could see the outside below the vestibule when I was laying down in the tent. And as I was trying to go to sleep, I saw a white light in the valley, maybe about uh, a quarter to half a mile away, I guess. Not right near my tent or anything. I wasn't close to any towns in the Sierra Mountains, south of the area, I would see an occasional remote cabin in the woods, so I figured that it must have just been that. But there were no access points or dirt roads up there, no forest clearings, just thick woods surrounded by mountains. I looked at the light for a bit and tried to think about what it could have been, but this was pretty remote, so I just couldn't come up with an explanation. I was tired from hiking all day though, so I didn't think too much more of it. A little later I looked out again and noticed another light though. It was an orange light slowly circling the white light. It was also slowly morphing into a, a shape as it circled. I watched it for a long time, trying to understand what the heck I was looking at. It had a very calm sort of motion and it was almost mesmerizing. It wasn't like a lot of other people's orb or UFO experiences where it sort of darts around and then just vanishes. I watched it for a little while and eventually I fell asleep. It started raining around midnight and I looked out of my tent and still saw both lights, one white stationary light and one orange morphing light. I woke up again at around 4am to go and pee and walked outside of my tent and it was still there, same motion. I tried to get a video but due to the distance and the darkness it looked like a, another terrible video that didn't show anything so I forgot about it. In the end I woke up at around sunrise and looked for it but at that point both lights were gone. I didn't see these lights around sunset or sunrise only ever in the darkness, and I know that these would have been visible during the sunrise and sunset too. They were pretty bright. I'm sure that there's an explanation that I can come up with eventually, but I genuinely have no clue what I was looking at, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Now, unrelated a bit, I guess, but near the area that I was walking and to the right of the trail was some thick brush at some point. Maybe... Uh, five to six feet tall, I would guess. This was near the Shasti Trinity Forest area, maybe one or two days after the lights of the woods. I was hiking alone, like I said, and I noticed about a hundred feet away from the brush was being sort of flattened by something, and whatever it was, it was moving very quickly. It was approaching the trail and was going to end up right next to me if I had continued my pace. I couldn't see what was flattening this brush, but... Whatever it was, it had to be very strong. It reminded me of something that you'd see in Jurassic Park almost. I instantly assumed that it was a bear. I still kind of think it was, but I didn't want to surprise the bear and have a close encounter or anything. So I yelled, stop. And it stopped, completely. 
I remained still and waited to see what was going on, but it was completely still, and it was also really eerily quiet everywhere, like total silence in the woods, which I'm not really used to. I got pretty unsettled by that, and I started talking to whatever it was while I walked by. I just kept saying things like, Hey, uh, I'm going to walk by and be on my way, friend. I hope you're having a good day. I kept walking and kept looking back, but nothing moved from that point onward. Like I said, probably a bear, right? Black bears are generally like big raccoons and they don't want to interact with humans by any means. But I've encountered a few bears before and they always run away when I told them to get lost. Like they get spooked and they leg it. Whatever this was, if it was a bear, it didn't move an inch. In fact, it just sat there and seemed to watch me. Anyway, after speaking with some other hikers that I'd met, a few people said how North Cow was a little bit unsettling. The SoCal Desert is very windy, and the Sierra Mountains have tons of flowing streams. NorCal doesn't have as many streams or as much wind, so there is just a sort of silence that pervades it, which can feel ominous, especially in the dark. And really, that's my best explanation for the feeling at least. But after going through the SoCal Desert, Sierra Mountains, NorCal, Oregon, and Washington, NorCal was the only section that was definitely a little bit unnerving to me. And I did portions of each of these sections alone too. Anyway, I still have no idea what those lights were. I don't know if they're related to the sound or the thing that was in the brush that day, but part of me thinks that somehow it's all connected. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl called Kay. Kay and I met in middle school, and we instantly clicked. We would hang out after school pretty frequently too. Kay had a, a very turbulent childhood, I guess you could say. Deceased father, foster care, substance abuse mum, and Kay's family would house hop a lot too. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt's ex-husband. My parents never really stressed about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. The man Kay was staying with, I'll call him R, was interesting to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me scratch my head was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family and R tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him, and he was venting to us, me 15 and Kay 16, about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio and all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him not thinking much of it. Sometimes when Kay and I hung out though, I would have us come to the basement and he had this room with a drum kit and he'd play them for us with the lights off and all that. But anyways, the strangest encounter I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out for the day, and she went to take a shower. While she was in the shower, I was sitting in her room, and I just so happened to wander in and told me that he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and R's room was the only room on the second floor. Being the naive girl I was, I agreed and followed him up the stairs. When he got to his room, he realized it was locked and seemed pretty annoyed and jittery because his key was apparently downstairs. Now, instead of going downstairs, R takes a credit card out of his wallet and tries to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work and I think at that point something clicked in my brain and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. I'm now 23 and looking back on it, I don't honestly think there was anything cool to show me in that room and I thank the moon and the stars that he never actually got that door unlocked. I never told Kay but as we got older, I casually asked her if she had any weird encounters with him and she said no. I'm 
not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful that I never got to see what was beyond that door because something tells me that if I had gone in that room that day, I would have come out a very different person. When I was 11, we first moved to California near the Yosemite area. Lots of forest and small lakes near where I lived. I moved right around when summer was ending and school was starting, so I took a bit to get settled and used to everything. Summer rolled around the next year, but my family is pushing me to get out of the house and do something besides staying inside and playing games all day. There was a lake with lots of dirt paths and such that was easy to explore, so I'd go around there a bit and just walk around, especially this one spot that had a cool little waterfall into a smaller lake from the bigger lake of that area. Well, one of those days, I'm walking to the lake and I spot someone by the waterfall. She's a girl around maybe my age, orange hair, freckles, and an accent that I wasn't able to understand at the time, which I think was a Tennessee accent. I've always been horrible with names, but I remember her name being a very common one, something like Alice or Cassie or something like that. As a young kid, I never really had crushes on girls. Most of the time, if I was friends with someone, them being a guy or a girl, it didn't really change much in how I interacted with them. And she was definitely the same way because we immediately got along. I remember us going to the lake and just walking around a lot. I talked a lot about living in Washington, what school was like, and video games. Something that I could tell went right over her head. She said that she was visiting her grandma over the summer at a house down the road from mine. I remember I had her number saved, so I'd text her whenever I was planning to go on a walk, and she'd meet me at the end of the driveway of the house that she was at. I remember her saying her grandma didn't want her going to my place, which was understandable. I mean, I'm a stranger to this woman, and so would my family be. But Alice didn't want me to come visit the grandma either, which I remember finding a bit weird. I remember my friend Eric, who lived near the lake, would always come by and wanted to come with me to walk around, and Alice told me that she'd rather it just be the two of us. Maybe it was because she didn't know him, but she would only come with me on those walks alone. I remember one time we walked out a bit further than usual on one of those dirt paths. This one was a bit awkward because of a hidden incline on this hill, and she'd have to pull me up for us to walk around and jump down when we walked back. Anyway, cut to near the end of summer and she's still hanging out with me, even meeting me at the end of my driveway. I remember one time I was having trouble finding my jeans so I didn't get cut by the bushes that we walked past all the time and told my mum before she went to work to tell Alice that I was going to be a little bit late. I'll explain in a bit why this is important as well but on our last day walking around, we went to the rock that kind of overlooked the lake and we just kind of sat there. I remember she was talking about her family and how much she preferred being there in California than where she was from. Something I don't remember though is if she ever told me specifically or not. And well, I said bye to her and said that I'd try to meet her at her house before she took off. I never did, I think I was forced to go school shopping or something that day, so I sent her a text telling her and she didn't seem upset or anything. I don't know if I just never checked in with her or I had forgotten her, but I never saved her contact. It was on an old flip phone that my parents had given me at the time when I was that young, and they didn't have a good texting or calling plan at the time. Anyway, cut to a good while later, 2021. A lot of drama is happening in my family, which I won't get into, but topics about my childhood and how I was treated are being brought up. I asked my mum about that year being forced to go outside more and if that was her decision or my father's. Spoilers, it was my father's. I brought up how it wasn't that bad though and that I had Alice to hang out with. And that sparked a bit of a nostalgic happiness that I hadn't felt in a while thanks to how bad that in the previous year was for us. Well, my mum then dropped and would tell me something that I continue to think back on over and over again. You mean that imaginary girl you walked around the lake with? I immediately thought that she was just messing with me, 
but she looked serious and thought that the time that I asked her to tell Alice that I was going to take a while, that I was talking about an imaginary friend, because she claimed that she never saw anyone when she went down the driveway, apparently. But I know that I had interacted with this girl. I know that I had gone with her to this lake many times, but I never thought about how I was the only person who ever saw her. And never my friend Eric or his brother who sometimes went to the lake with me, not my family, never even met her grandmother as well. Today, I cannot even confirm if I ever had this girl's number or if I ever even actually texted her. It threw me off a good bit, but then I remembered one thing that made me know that I was right and that she was real. You see, one time in July when I was walking with Alice to the lake, my grandma had stopped by to give me a soda while she was heading to my house to give my dad something. Well, when I had next talked to my grandma, I brought it up, and she didn't really know what I was talking about at first, not until I brought up Alice. Oh yes, I remember your dad always brought up how you and some girl would walk around the lake, and I thought it was cute. Weird that he thought it was a real girl and not one of your imaginary friends. This absolutely rocked me to the core. I mean, there's just no way that I imagined all of this. And I still have no idea what she could mean by one of my imaginary friends. If I ever find that old phone, if I even still have it in a box somewhere, I'm getting to the bottom of this because I am certain that she was real. Otherwise, who the heck have I been imagining this whole time? Out back of my neck of the woods is an old dirt road. It's hard to access unless you know how to take a turn down another old road that runs around the back of the coal mine that I work at. If you follow that old road, you get to a T intersection that you can either turn right out to Hale Creek or left, which will take you out to Mount Coulon. Now, Mount Coulon isn't much of a town anymore. It's an outback pub and that's pretty much it. There used to once be a town there, but everyone up and left once the railway line got moved to the coast. That was the only reason the town existed for so long, in fact. Or for as long as it did anyway. It wasn't the start of the town though, you see. Way back in the early 1900s, gold was found in them by a prospector named Thomas Coulon. He staked his claim and settled there with his family. Some local aboriginals found him and his family living on their land and weren't too happy about it. So they attacked his home, throwing rocks through the windows and generally antagonizing him. Well, Thomas went out and shot the lot of them all dead. Then in a fit of grief over what he had done, sat down on his porch and, well, deleted himself all over the wall behind him. Fast forward to the year 2021, I was working out at Hale Creek Mine at the time on the maintenance crew. I had a big seven nights of 12 hour shifts and had very little sleep. I had left my mining camp the following afternoon, still not feeling the best, but set out for a long drive back home to Moranbar. Dusk came along, then nightfall. I was driving for what seemed like forever, trying to make my way back home. I was constantly looking out for the turnoff on the old back road that ran up behind a Gunyella mine, but it never came. I kept on driving and driving. Hours went by. I was on very unfamiliar road at this point. It started to bend and twist and turn all over, and narrow to the point that my little Kia Rio could barely get by without scratching the sides on branches of old looming trees hanging over the road. I was definitely lost, so I pulled over to check my Google Maps. No signal, of course. I was really confused though, I mean, did I miss the turn? I thought maybe it's a little further up, so I pressed on and kept driving. Then, out of nowhere I see an old and worn sign off to the left of me on the side of the old dirt road, Mount Coulon. 15 kilometers. I thought, okay, yep, I've gone way too far out in the sticks here, 
I better turn around. Before I could though, I saw off to my right the entrance to what looked like a cemetery with an old and rusty archway and above on the archway it was in this rusty rough iron lettering, Betsy's Rest. Oh, my curiosity got the better of me so I veered in there to have myself a quick squiz. And sure as heck, there was a road that went into a giant U-shape around an old cemetery full of tombstones. Generations of cattle farmers and jackaroos who all must have worked on the various stations in the area. And it gave me the spooks pretty bad. So I got out of there quickly and made my way back onto the old back road. I kept heading back from whence I came, hoping and praying that I'll find this T-intersection eventually. Over an hour passed, and then my worst fear happened. The fuel light flickered on my dashboard. I'm driving on this road in absolutely the middle of nowhere. It's now midnight. No one will probably find me for days if I ran out of fuel. I was absolutely beside myself. I mean, this is the outback of Australia. You run out of fuel, water, food in the outback, you may have just signed your own death certificate. Pretty much done and dusted, in fact. All I had was a couple of sandwiches that I took from the camp mess hall and a bottle of water. Better than nothing, I suppose, but not enough to last a couple of days stranded on the side of an old back road with no phone signal. So I keep cruising along being extremely careful not to go too quickly or over accelerate around all the twists and the turns. As I'm driving along this lonely road I then see a, a shadow out of the corner of my eye. I don't think too much of it, staying focused on the road ahead looking for this turn off. But then that's when I hear it, swooping and sort of whooshing noises above my car and I mean the heck right I then look up and see what I can only describe as a giant bat creature with red eyes flying directly above my car it obviously startles me and makes me accelerate at a rapid rate yet it's flying overhead gliding effortlessly and keeping in pace with me I'm watching my speedometer reaching neck breaking speeds and I'm bouncing all over the old and bumpy road while this creature glides down to my driver's side window, looks inside at me, and then just grimaces. Then, just as it does, it flies up and just disappears into the night air as quickly as it had appeared. I floored that old clunker of a car of mine until my heart leapt with joy at the sign of life in that desolate hellscape. I saw the Gunyella Mine CHPP's light cut through the vast and empty void of darkness. I knew then and there that I was within 10 to 15 kilometers of the intersection and the turn off back home. And thankfully, I found it. I eventually managed to get all the way back home and I was very grateful that my clunker ran on an oily rag and the vapors in my tank pretty much kept me alive. I told my partner at the time all about the nightmare that I had been through as she had been expecting me home the evening prior and it was now six in the morning. My phone was full of missed calls from her for which I apologized profusely. I hadn't even thought to check my phone as I had no signal for the better part of the entire journey anyway. And while this was a pretty scary experience, the experience that I had with my partner when I convinced ourselves to drive all the way out there one night was perhaps even worse. It was just to see the actual town but months had passed and I kept having recurring nightmares about that vile winged creature. It seemed to have entered my dreams at this point. I awoke one night sweating in bed. My heart rate was racing. My partner asked, well, what's wrong? Uh, again I had been waking her up late at night when I would have this horrible nightmare the whole situation had really impacted me the desolate hellscape would re-emerge in the dark nights plagued by the old outback road menacing my demise with the off chance that I would make one wrong move and come undone escaping that creature something had to be done and 
I knew what I needed to do. You see, I'm a man that will openly admit that I cannot overcome anything in life unless I face it head on. That's really the only way that I know. No use sticking your head in the sand and pretending things will just go away, so I spoke with my partner and after much discussion, we both agreed that we would go back and investigate the back road at Mount Coulon and investigate the town itself. And to really drive the nail in, we were going to do it at night as well. I just needed answers, I guess. I needed to know what lay at the end of that old road, and whatever else I may have missed on my first misadventure. We set out at 6.30pm and headed for the old back road, which now is inaccessible. You can go take a look for yourself, but the mine has shut the gate as it runs along the inside of the mine's boundary. Anyway, we were driving my partner at the time's new Mitsubishi Mirage. It was a, a real beast of a car, I guess you could say, but it had all the kit that we needed for the long drive and we made sure that we left prepared. Esky full of food, water and snacks, my toolkit in case of a breakdown, torches, first aid kit, two-way radio, battery pack for phones and the two-way radio, my trusty hunting knife, which I kept in my side door compartment. I mean, as if I was going out there again completely unarmed with who knows what was out there in the dark. But the first leg of our adventure was actually rather fun. I felt a bit like Colin McRae, taking the old dirt road and twisted and turned in all directions, slithering my way up to the T-intersection. Once we got to the intersection, I took the left turn to head north and gradually west. The familiar road was as it was the same night that I encountered the strange flying beast. Except tonight brought a slight amount of comfort as there was a full moon in the night sky illuminating the surrounding and edges of the road. As we approached the old cemetery, I told my partner to look right. She was honestly in awe as well. I asked if she wanted to go take a look, but she was too nervous about it, so I just kept on driving along. As the night went on, we came to the point of no return. The road became nothing more than just a dirt track interspersed with sealed sections that the local farmers had laid prior to and after crossing old relics of bridges. They were rusty and wrought iron, sturdy still but foreboding at the same time. We crossed two of them on one stretch, one built over the coal fields railway line heading eastward to the port, another was over a deep ravine, the bottom was clouded by dense native plants. The road got very narrow at one point and snaked right and left and down and up. We were in unfamiliar territory now and I was growing apprehensive about what I would see or find. At one point though I could have swore that there was just no road at all. We were basically driving through a wide open field and I had to drive at 40 kilometers an hour max to avoid any ruts or depressions in the bulldust. I was starting to think this entire trip might have been a mistake when the road then came good again to a compacted dirt section. A random sign appeared off to the right of the road stating that we were now deep in Aboriginal land. The drive went on and on and on. Hours seemed to have passed. Were we any closer to our destination? For reference, I switched the car's function from Bluetooth headset to radio scan, the FM and AM for any signs of life, but there was nothing. I thought, well, I'll check again in an hour, and an hour had passed, so I checked, scanning and scanning. And then there was a muffled and distorted voice emitting through our car all of a sudden. And then, the sweet sound of music. Ironically enough as well, it was actually ACDC's Highway to Hell. How befitting, I thought to myself. I said to my partner, Hey, uh, check the signal on your phone now. She replied with two bars. She immediately checked Google Maps. I parked the car in this small spot of salvation while it loaded up. Now, according to Google Maps, we were about 30 minutes away from a fork in the road. One way heading west out into the Never Never, another heading towards Mount Coulon. A good thing we checked as well, so we headed onwards. And sure enough, there it was, the fork in the road. 
no signage indicating which way to go, just one road slightly more compact than the other and a bit wider as well. So we kept true to the road that we were on and then came to a faint glimmer in the distance, a faint yellow light on the horizon. As we approached the light, it developed into a service station, off to the left of the old dirt road with a storefront that looked completely empty, save for a cash register on a countertop. We were now at the main intersection, signage indicating that to head right was to head towards Collinsville, left out west into the Never Never. I came to a stop off to the right shoulder off the road on a dirt patch made by trucks that had obviously turned here before. I checked the fuel gauge and it was half a tank. I looked into that old rundown service station, scanning the area for any other signs of life outside of the faint yellow glow of the iridescent tube lights above the old and rusted bowsers that looked like they hadn't been used since the 1980s. Then I saw a figure emerging from a back room. It was a, a frail old woman, her hair tattered and sort of distressed. It honestly looked like we may have awoken her. The time was now 11.30. She came to a stop inside the abandoned storefront and just stood there staring at our car. I thought, better come forward and ask if there's any chance of fueling up. So I pulled in and rolled down the window. She came outside into the night air and approached me with a great deal of hesitation. Uh, excuse me. Look, I'm really sorry if I woke you up. Uh, we're just wondering if you had any fuel. She stood there, glaring and studying me. Her face withered from the harsh outback climate. She then said, Uh, no, no fuel here. You better leave now. Something felt off about that, the way she spoke. There was a, a tension between us, I guess. And so I just said, Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so sorry again. We'll leave now. Thanks again and sorry again. So I wound the window up and I just got out of there. We drove around the old pub in the center of what was once the town. It had multiple V double road train trucks parked all around it. Almost like they were protecting the pub itself with a wall of steel and rubber in the desolate darkness. A picnic table with a tin roof cover appeared on the right side of this massive loop road. The only road in the entire area was sealed, even if it was rather narrow. As for lighting, well, what lighting? This place clearly was not welcoming after dark. Albeit for two streetlights in the entire area that glowed faintly, only illuminating small patches of the loop road, you definitely wouldn't want to be out here with no headlights. We did the brief tour of all that was out there though, then made our way back towards the road back home. Then eventually, made our way back towards the road back home. My partner then said, hold up. So I came to a stop again, off to the side of the road, back out to Morin Bar. She had just discovered on Google Maps a quicker way back home apparently. This way would take us out on that old dirt road, out west into the fork in the road. However, as you continue down that road for 50 kilometers, you come to another fork in the road, and taking the leftward track will take us to the Gunyella Road, which then headed back home. Good eye, I said to her. So, on we went. Thankfully, the Mitsubishi ran on an oily rag as well. It was only a little four-cylinder powerhouse like my Kia Rio, so I felt confident that we'd make it back. On the drive back, it was another long and slow slog. At some points, I'd have to slow to like 20 kilometers per hour, just to make it around some tight bends and twistings, and turning through the rough and thoroughfare which went between wide open cattle farming properties. Then at points the bushland would thicken around creeks and runoff areas, and you could see a meter off the sides of the road. After taking the leftward turn in what was a slight fork in the road, we made our way homebound and that was when it happened. Some sort of a large creature came bounding out from the dense bushland and right in front of our car. I came to an abrupt stop immediately and there in our headlights was a massive cow. It looked at us, then took off back into the bushland. 
I was a little bit stunned because that was close, too close. After gathering myself, we went back home and the rest of the journey was, well, rather mundane to say the least. I guess the only exception was an interesting stretch of road that had been well sealed and snaked through dense bushland. I was impressed by the craftsmanship of how well compacted it was. Then suddenly we were back on dirt road again. I was on and we made it to the Gunyella Road, intersections with lighting signaling the turnoffs to local mines and explosive factories that make the bomb products for them and so on and so forth. The usual kin of the coal fields. Then we made it home as the first light of morning emitted from the horizon. Pulling into our driveway, we both looked at each other, shrugged as if to signal what the heck was all that about, then got out of the car and we headed inside. It's a, a strange feeling out there. It's the desolation, I think. The lack of, I guess. It's what really drives the tension, I suppose. I mean, any moment can be fraught with demise, but it gave me the closure that I needed to put to rest the monsters in my head, because whatever I saw that night when I made that near-fatal misadventure, I guess it's going to remain a mystery for me. Who knows, maybe that might actually be for the best. We rent a home that, for reasons that no one will explain, is about half of the rental rate in our area. We've been here for about five years and the owner has not raised the rent a dime at all. But strange things consistently happen in the house. Most of them are pretty benign and I guess easily dismissed. Things being moved around without explanation, odd noises, feeling like someone is moving around when rooms are empty but our dog will suddenly start barking at something that he seems to see. Lately though, things have become more, I don't know, like, I guess the word is aggressive. Several times my wife and I have physically felt something touch us, only to turn and find the room empty. I felt a strong tap on my, I felt a strong tap on my sternum. My wife had something blow in her ear so deliberate that she actually started crying out of fear. But today, today was the strangest. So I went to open a door to a stairway down into the basement this morning. And the whole door literally fell onto me. Aside from me, no one in our home is really capable of doing this too. Our kids are way too young. The door was fine last night. I heard nothing during the night. Our dog sleeps next to that door as well. So it's weird that they didn't bark or anything. Really, I, I just have no explanation, and that's why I'm here. I don't know what to do about any of this. So my question for all of you is, what should we do? So, me, a 32-year-old male, and my brother, 28 and male, and our disabled mother, all lived together in a trailer about 30 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee. I was wary of moving there at first for the stereotypes you may hear about trailer parks, but luckily we've had zero issues in the 10 years that we've been here. We have very nice neighbors, well-kept yards, etc, etc. About a week ago, we were finally putting up our Christmas tree, drinking probably too much beer, listening to Christmas music, Christmas spirit in full swing. During our random banter, my brother says, Oh yeah, I can't believe I forgot to tell you earlier today. At work, the owner had to kick out some guy who was acting super creepy. My brother works at the Stocker at a family-owned little market about a mile from our home. He went on to tell me that this younger-looking guy was pacing the aisles, sometimes standing still for minutes at a time and not responding when the owner would ask if he needed help finding something. After about 20 minutes of this, the owner asked him to please leave because he was apparently scaring the customers and without a word, he left. Anyway, we continue with our good time, hanging ornaments, drinking, getting our mum involved as well, 
with ornaments, not the drinking of course, and all is good. We wrap up at around 10.30pm, help our mum to bed, she's in a wheelchair, and decide that we might as well finish off the ton of beer that we have left and just admire our decked out tree. Around 11.30 we decided to go on the front porch to share a cigarette as we usually do when we've tired on a good buzz. My brother opens the door and almost immediately closes it. I ask what's up and he says, no way, the guy I was telling you about, just like Michael Myers, walked down the street past our house dude. I thought that that was pretty strange but I wasn't super concerned. We waited a few minutes then went and smoked as we did usually and went back inside. Now, my brother and I aren't troublemakers at all, but I'm pretty confident in our ability to defend ourselves if we had to. At this point, these are just thoughts in the back of my mind though. After all, I haven't even seen this guy. Yet, anyway. Fast forward to about 2 in the morning. We're more than drunk enough to go ahead and call it a night, after one more ciggy. My brother opens the door and within seconds I hear him say, Whoa, whoa, hey man, you good? Hey, buddy, what's up? You good? I'm in the kitchen at that time, but quickly decided that this doesn't sound right and rush over to the door. What I see when I get to the open door is a younger man standing on our deck about three feet from our front door. He's pretty tall, about 6'4", and another thing that I noticed is that he looks a lot like Adam Driver, which was a detail my brother jokingly mentioned earlier during tree time, so... I'm realizing for the first time that this must be the guy that he's been talking about. One thing my brother must not have got close enough to notice at work though was this guy's eyes. I am not exaggerating when I say that I have never seen anything like it. His body language was super menacing, but his eyes were the strangest combination of wide-eyed bewilderment and fury. Like, us opening our front door confused him and also made him very angry. I joined my brother in explaining to him that it's late and that he should head home. After what I'd say was about 30 seconds of staring, he just walked off without a word. I peeked out of our blinds to make sure that he really left and saw nothing. We both tried to laugh it off and were saying things like, well that was pretty weird, huh? but it took a while for my adrenaline to sort of taper down. But the thing that I kept thinking to myself that bothered me was those 30 seconds to me felt like he was the one deciding what the next move would be. But what that could have been, I have no idea. I also didn't love that my brother said when he opened the door he was already standing there, so for how long was he actually there for? We calmed down watching some YouTube videos in the end, and after about 30 minutes or so, I say to my brother, okay man, let's just go to bed. I'll take one more look outside to be safe, but I feel like it wasn't really necessary. I open the door and he's back again. The streetlights are paced very far apart in our trailer park, but at the edge of our driveway, there, I see his silhouette probably 50 feet away again, just staring at our front door. I feel I should mention here that he's not there texting or on the phone with someone or anything. He's just standing there. I feel bad in hindsight because I'm sure this poor guy definitely has mental health issues, but between being drunk and exhausted and the look he gave us earlier, I was just over it. I finally put some bass into my voice and said, Hey man, you can't just stand in our driveway. You're being creepy, dude. Just please leave. I really don't want to call the cops on you, so just don't make me do it. This seemed to work. His demeanor didn't change at all, but the word cops seemed to do the trick. He turned around and he walked away. In the end, I really hope that we handled that well. I understand and empathize with people with mental health problems and have friends and family who unfortunately suffer from those things too. However, I still cannot shake the feeling that something bad could have happened that night. He didn't finally leave our porch earlier that night until I showed up to the door, essentially making him outnumbered, and even then he still came back afterward. 
Look, I hope he's okay out there. We haven't seen him since. I also hope not calling the police wasn't a bad choice and that he isn't out there with bad intentions on somebody else's front deck at like two in the morning who lives alone or is elderly, etc. I wish I could have figured out what that was all about, but during every interaction me or my brother had with him that day and night, he just never spoke a word, which in the end is perhaps the creepiest part of this whole event. I still feel extremely confused, honestly. It was 2017, so quite a few years ago at this point, but I still to this day cannot wrap my head around it. I was about 11, maybe 12 at the time, 19 now. It was around 7.40 in the morning and the sun was out and shining bright on a weekday. My mum and I were driving to school when just a minute past by my house we were coming up to the railroad tracks, which we did every day, except this morning we saw a man walking. I didn't think too much of it except that it was odd that he was wearing all black. Black jeans, black zip-up hoodie, black shoes... He was bent over seemingly when we were just starting to see the figure and then it stood up and I think it had hands in its pockets. He was walking on the left side of the road, off onto some grass with his hoodie up over his head. He began to walk but as we got close, he whipped his head around and looked at us. I expected to see a guy's face but instead I saw nothing but pure blackness, darkness a shadow where a face should be. I was staring in disbelief. The thing seemed to be scared oddly and began running. I have no idea why, even then I was so confused. But it ran for a few seconds, which seemed like a while to be seeing what I was seeing. And then, it just slid down onto the grass on its butt and leaned on its right side and hopped off like it would on a ledge. Mum kept driving slowly and we watched the figure disappear just into the ground. We both stared at the place where it went and it was just gone. A second later, as we finally began to go over the tracks, I uttered, Mum? And she looked over at me and just said, I don't know. And asked if she saw it and she just said, yeah, yeah, I saw it. And then we both just sat there, I guess, thinking. In this experience, I didn't feel threatened or anything. I didn't feel like it was planning to harm us, but it was so confusing. Why did it not have a face? Why did it run like that? Why did it act like we weren't supposed to be able to see it either? Why did it go into the ground like that? Why was it wearing such stereotypical stalker or robber or scary man clothes? Does it mean hell is real? Did it go there? Or was it a demon? I've never even been a believer in the paranormal. I've always rejected the idea of God or religion in general and I still can't get into that sort of stuff. As time went on though, I kind of ignored this memory, I guess. I ignored how it affected me. I now recently have been thinking about it again and I just cannot wrap my head around it. I know that I'm not crazy because my mum saw it too and can describe it the same as I do. I just can't comprehend how it was real. But it was just as real as any other person walking on the street. I don't know why I'm sharing this to be honest. I just need someone to relate to about this I guess. I've been feeling emotional about it lately. So is there anyone out there who can maybe help me understand this? Anyone else experienced something similar? I've been to the spot multiple times since then and I've never seen anything again. I haven't seen anything paranormal since in fact. I don't know what to think about any of this and it means a lot to me to not feel so alone and confused in this experience and sometimes life in general, I guess. I guess I just don't know how to process there being other things like this. The 
Last year, I, an 18-year-old female, was living in a very rural town in the middle of the mountains. Most small western towns only have one road that goes into the big city. Our road in particular was about 50 miles of empty highway, surrounded only by cliffs, fields, and occasionally a farm. At the very entrance to this road, once you enter the city, is a huge truck stop or gas station that is always packed. Now, my mum and I were going back home after a midnight showing of whatever movie we had decided to see, and as per usual, we stopped to fill up on gas and get a drink for the long drive home. As we were leaving, I vaguely noticed a dingy older jeep pull out at the same time that we did, but of course, I didn't take much notice of it. It wasn't weird at all that somebody would be leaving at the same time as us. As we started down the pitch black road, the jeep kept a steady pace behind us, again not weird, until it came flying up past us before disappearing behind a hill. Mum and I just sort of scoffed at it. We were going 60, but when people knew the roads well, they often drove them at close to 100 at least, even at night. Eventually though, we came up to the jeep from before and... It was pulled over, but the back half of the vehicle was in the road, and what was clearly a man's arm was waving at the window, gesturing for us to pull over. Of course, we just pass it. The man flies past us once more and pulls over again. He does this once more, and my mum and I begin to get very nervous at this point. After passing him for the third time, he flies up and begins tailgating us. He's driving so close now that we can't actually see his headlights in the rearview mirror, and he's honking his horn every so often, waving his arm for us to pull over. He carries on with this for another 30 minutes. Mum and I are terrified. She's white knuckling the wheel. I'm holding a pocket knife to make myself feel better. I swore at my mum for the first time that night, begging her not to pull over. If you've ever seen the movie Rest Stop, then that is all that was going through my mind. The road is a complete dead zone for service, so we couldn't call the police or anyone for that matter. And the picture of us dead or worse on the side of the empty road was the only thing that I could think about. But just as suddenly as it had all started, it ended. The man slammed on his brakes, turned around and just went back. The ride home was eerily silent and I ended up sleeping in my mum's room out of fear. The next morning we had a discussion and came to the conclusion that me had seen two lone women travelling at night and thought that we'd be easy pickings, which he would have been right to be honest. Some people suggest that he had seen us drop money or a receipt at the gas station and wanted to be a good Samaritan. Personally, I think that's ridiculous. Nobody following two women home in such an aggressive manner has good intentions. We moved out of town a few months later for unrelated reasons, but just before we did, the same car was reported following a group of four men on their way to work. So, maybe he just likes to scare people? Either way, that night was easily one of the scariest that I've ever had. Mid-2000s, I was in college out in eastern central Ohio, near Zanesville. There was a small bit of woods that hadn't been developed over behind campus, and within the woods was an older shelter house that had been locked up and had bars over the windows. Sometimes, you would swear that you could feel eyes watching you from that building. In addition, you'd find random ritual circles out in the woods themselves, usually near the old collapsed buildings. At one specific time, I remember being around campus during a, a break in the fall and I went to walk through the woods to go sit by a pond behind it. I sat around for longer than I'd planned to, so it was approaching sunset when I started to walk back. And by the time that I crossed the threshold of the trees, everything just felt wrong. It was eerily quiet and I immediately felt goosebumps all over. Everything in me was screaming panic, but to my knowledge, there was no major predators that close to campus. Regardless though, I started to pick up my pace since that feeling only got worse. 
and after a minute or two, I was basically running. As soon as I broke out of the tree cover, all of those feelings stopped and it felt perfectly normal. An important thing to note is that the distance that I had to go was maybe a thousand feet through the woods and I could see all the way to the other side. I never walked out there at night by myself after that, but on a different occasion, I went driving south of campus late at night because I couldn't sleep and just decided to wander around. I had done this several times in the past, so I had a loose route that I took, except I decided to take a different turn this time and see where it went. I don't know what road I turned onto, but it eventually turned to dirt and gravel, admittedly not super surprising in rural Ohio, but then it just came to a stop at a fence with a little turnaround circle of dirt. I was extremely confused and didn't have a GPS, so I couldn't really look up where I ended up, but I could have swore that I saw a human-shaped movement in the fields or trees on the other side of the fence. At that, I quickly turned around and got away from there, and a day or so later, I had told a couple of friends about this, and we tried to find that spot again, but we never could. I checked maps, digital and physical, but I either had no concept for where I was, which is entirely possible, I admit, or something very weird happened. Whatever the case, there is something strange about those woods, and... I, to this day, swear that I saw something human-shaped in there. Rural Ohio is weird, and it can be creepy sometimes. This happened when I was about 14 or 15, and I often stayed over at my cousin and her husband's house. Their names are Skylar and Josh. So, I'd been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues. It was in the summertime, in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding. You know, those sort of monochrome suburban nightmare cul-de-sacs. There were tons of half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood, and I feel that this information is pretty important to the story. Anyways... Josh and I are avid movie watchers and stayed up late most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather, then Ridiculous 6. Movie sucks by the way, but semi-important context is that Josh is a smoker and he goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often, especially at night when he takes their beagle banjo out to pee. So, I end up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches. This couch is backed against a wall and to the left of it is a window into the backyard. It's the only window in the living room. And at some point, I keep hearing Banjo whooping and hollering in the playroom. Then again in the kitchen, then the playroom and so on and so forth. The dog is going crazy in literally every room of the first floor, but He's a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of their room, so I figured that he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being pretty vocal. In hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room, though. But whatever. I try to sleep through it, and after a good while of Banjo flipping out in what I think is the kitchen, he kind of just goes quiet. But... He wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch that I'm sleeping on. He was just not being still. I still don't get up though. I fall back to sleep for a bit. Then out of nowhere, he jumps on the couch right on my stomach and again starts losing it, barking and howling. But that wasn't what woke me up though. It was the light shining from outside the window right in my face. I was scared at first, more confused than anything since my eyes haven't adjusted at this point. Then the flashlight shines up right onto the man's face and he looks identical to Josh. Could have been twins in fact. He's crouched down with his face almost against up on the glass and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed but the man starts laughing at me and I can hear it from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, I assume it's Josh on a, a smoke break just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs and pass by the kitchen clock, and it's four in the morning. 
I didn't even put two and two together that Josh has no reason to be outside awake at this hour. I'm so groggy, but also unnerved at this point, so I just go to sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go and alert Skylar of what had just happened, mostly because she's just really cranky when you wake her up, and I was still more than willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break, rather than some maniac scoping out the house. Anyway, the next afternoon I bring it up to them, and they sort of write it off and ask me if I'm sure that I wasn't dreaming, etc. But they did say that they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there and I kind of wanted to vomit because the tall grass along the house was now pressed down like someone had been on their knees there. I don't know how long the man was sitting there for the grass to have been pressed down like that but still I have a feeling that it must have been pretty long because Banjo sat by that window for a hot minute and the flashlight is the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad that I saw the grass though because it felt like such a fever dream that I just wasn't sure up until then. Sometimes I, I still wonder if it actually happened but deep down I know that it did. My theory is that some squatter in those unfinished houses was either bored or on something and decided to go on an adventure. But the one thing that I cannot explain is why the guy looked so much like Josh. Like... Isn't that weird? So I grew up in Appalachian, Pennsylvania, and I spent a lot of time in the woods just enjoying nature. My buddies and I had a, a night game too that we used to play where we'd dress in black and then send someone out with a 15 minute head start and then go and hunt them. Their goal was to hide and separate us from the group and capture people in the hunting party, at which point the captured person switched teams. It was sort of like a capture the flag, but with less rules, I guess. We would always play on this private land so that we would be assured that we wouldn't run into anyone who wasn't supposed to be there. But anyway, one day we sent out our runner and then we the hunters went out to find them after the requisite amount of time. The game this time was being held in the wooded ravine with a flat creek bottom that was about three to four hundred meters away from a house that we were staying with the grassy field between the house and the gorge. The last we saw Dennis, our runner, went into the gorge. We crossed the field and had made it to the edge of the ravine and posted up on the rim. We stopped to listen because we were positioned quite well and you could see and hear pretty far. We sat there for maybe ten minutes before... We began to hear things. At first, it sounded like a, I don't know, like a faraway noise of a, a woman vocalizing gently. Then a, a murmur began of what sounded like more women. I looked at my friends and we were obviously confused because we thought that maybe there was an illegal kegger party or something happening. When all of a sudden, the ravine exploded with the sound with those same women screaming. It was an inhuman type of noise and it was sort of in a chorus almost. It was not just one voice but dozens of wailing howls and my blood instantly ran cold. Nobody spoke. We all just took off and we ran. We booked it as hard as we could back to the house and across the field. We make it halfway through when Dennis erupts from an ambush to catch us because he thinks the game is still on. We all evade and just keep running past and... He sees the fear and after standing there confused a minute, he follows behind. We made it to the house, we shut the windows, locked the doors and just sat there scared. The next morning we hiked back out but we just never found anything. I, female and 52 at the time, was traveling by car to an out-of-town job assignment. I had stopped at a, a popular and busy gas station or travel stop to fill up the car, stretch my legs, use the restroom and grab a snack. I was approached by a developmentally disabled woman who appeared to be in her maybe mid-twenties. She was looking for a ride to a town a couple of towns over. Her ride had abandoned her while she was in the restroom apparently. 
She was a little upset. She didn't have a cell phone and she didn't know any phone numbers so I could call someone for her. I checked with the employees at the store and they said that she had been there for an hour looking for a ride because she said that her friends left her while she was in the restroom. I then made the decision to do something that honestly I've never done before. Offer a stranger a ride. I wasn't going to the town that she wanted to go to but I was heading in that direction and I told her that I could drop her off at the grocery store in the next town over where I would be turning off to go to my destination. The grocery store was always busy and it was very likely that she'd have an easier time getting a, a ride to where she wanted to go there. Also she'd be 5 miles away from where she wanted to go instead of 25 miles and she'd have an easier time walking that distance if she had to. This was agreeable to her and so we set off. Right away though, I noticed a van following us. I tried to lose the van but it kept pace. Meanwhile, the woman wanted to play with my phone. I told her no that it wasn't a toy, it was for work and I moved it out of her reach. When the van speeds up and starts to get closer. The woman suddenly remembers her boyfriend's phone number and we need to call him. I can't use my phone while driving, this was pre-car sync voice activated operation, and I was approaching the outskirts of the business district of the next town, and no cell phone use while driving signs everywhere. I told her that we're almost at the grocery store, that we can call him from the parking lot when we get there. She becomes agitated and yells, no, you have to take me home. I told you that I can't do that, I'm not going there. It's in the opposite direction of where I need to go and I'm expected soon. Look, we'll call him from the parking lot, okay? She becomes even more upset and frustrated and the van is getting closer now too. I pull into the grocery store parking lot. It's about 4pm. The grocery store is busy. I pull up in front of the store and ask for the boyfriend's number. She suddenly can't remember his number. She won't get out of the car either. She's arguing with me and the van is pulling into the parking lot now. There's a sheriff's deputy parked nearby and I roll down my window and signal that I need to speak to him. He walks over and asks me what's going on. I tell him where I met the woman and now she won't get out of the car and under my breath I tell him that the van has been following us. The deputy tells the woman, Look, she brought you where you asked her to. It's time for you to leave her car now. She slowly gets out of the car and I ask once more for her boyfriend's number and she says, you're crazy, I don't have a boyfriend. Oh, look, there's my friends now. And she points to that same van. The deputy and I share a look and he says, give me your contact info, I can delay them for about 20 minutes while I check their license and registration and lecture them about abandoning a special needs adult. You get out of here and... I'll check on you before my shift is over, and don't pick up any more hitchhikers, okay? I left and went to my destination. He called me to make sure that I got to where I was going, and told me that they were keeping an eye on the van and its owner. He told me that he also contacted a colleague at the sheriff's department in the county where I was working, and that she would contact me in a day or two. While I was on assignment there, I spoke to two deputies and a detective about the woman in the van. No one ever really told me anything about them, but they were very interested in them for whatever reason. My nightmare though is that one day I'll turn on a true crime show and see a report about this woman and her gang robbing and killing people or something. I'm grateful that the deputy was there because without him, I really don't know what would have happened. I live in a very rural town in Australia. I have a close-knit group of about maybe four to five friends and we hang out all the time. On this specific day, I was at my friend's house. About two days before this, her family came home and all the doors were wide open, yet nothing was taken. This family isn't one to leave their doors open by any means. Specifically too in this town where crime runs rampant, pretty much no one does. Anyway, on the day that I was over, my two friends Alyssa and Mike were there. 
me and Mike were over at Alyssa's just hanging out on our phones when the front door banged open. We all looked at each other but brushed it off as the wind slamming the door. In hindsight, wind would not be able to reach this door as it was pretty much in a little covering. I don't know how to explain it but you sort of walk up the stairs and there's a little room and there's the front door. Maybe two minutes later as well, the two sliding back doors slammed very loudly. We again brushed it off to not scare ourselves. We're kind of dumb, but anyway. Then we heard loud noises inside the house and footsteps running around their noisy wooden floor. Obviously, this is where alarm bells started firing in my head. I was thinking about how someone had already been there and wondering if this was the same person or people. We jumped up and me and Alyssa held the bedroom door closed. Her room doesn't have a lock. Alyssa suggested that we call the police. I didn't think that it was a good idea, but as I'm holding the door, someone starts running and slams into her door. At this point, it was definitely time to call the police. They pick up, try to talk to Alyssa. A little difficult because she's bawling her eyes out now. Eventually, the operator understood and within less than two minutes, police are at the door. These police officers were really kind and just asked about the situation before saying we found the kid. I thought that they meant that the person that broke in, so I asked them about the kid. The police looked confused and said, the missing five-year-old. We had no clue that there was even a missing child on the loose. The police officer said that there was about 40 cars looking for this kid and many police knocking on doors to ask if someone had seen her. I think the police were kind. Their reasoning for breaking into this house was absolutely crazy. They said that it was probably a police officer running in and looking for the kid. We all looked confused and then he realized what he had said and backtracked saying that they should have announced themselves though. But I just don't know. The whole thing is really sketchy and really weird. It was also a pretty scary experience with the police officers trying to calm us down, but after talking about it with my friends, whoever broke in probably saw Alyssa's mum leaving the house with two teens in the back, so they thought that the house was empty. Alyssa has a brother, so altogether they have three in the house, but to this day her brother had a friend over and they were driving somewhere, apparently. Well, that's what they said. Anyway, it was a really weird experience and to be quite honest, I still really don't know what to think about it. I would like to share with you an encounter that I had in September of 2012 in a French woods. I'm not sure of the name of the forest, but I'm still haunted by this creepy encounter and I'm having a hard time accepting that I'm unable to know exactly what this creature was. So, I was 20 and I was in an old small truck with an old friend, a 55 year old who was the driver. I was sitting in the passenger place on the right side of the truck. The truck was really old and I remember that we couldn't go faster than like 30 or 40 kilometers an hour. We were driving from Normandy and we took only the very small road in order to stop anywhere that we wanted to visit this old church at or an abandoned house or a German fortification, etc. In other words, we weren't in any real rush. We were expecting to arrive though at our destination, a house that belonged to friends of mine at around 3 in the morning. But we were late and it was 3 a.m. when we enter a huge dark forest in the night. We were driving slowly in the woods on a straight small road. The old lights of the truck were some kind of blinking yellow. And at one point, I saw some very black humanoid outlines on the left side of the road. It was a very clear outline too because it was the light of the truck that sort of outlined it. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have been able to see it. But the creature was on two legs as a biped would walk. No tail. And at first, I really couldn't see any arms. As we were slowly approaching the creature though, I saw it turning its head in our direction. We were silent in the truck, saying no words. My friend was just driving and I was wondering if I was hallucinating. We slowly drive in its direction and it started to cross the road as it was staring at us. 
It had huge yellow eyes, a bit like an owl. It was around maybe two meters high. We almost were at its level and I remember fearing that if I opened my truck door that it would probably grab me. I saw its arms sort of swinging along its thin black hairy body. It had hair all over its body as well. I saw its outline as we approached it but it arrived on the other side of the road and suddenly stopped, turned in our direction, still staring at me or us. A few seconds later we passed it and I didn't move my head, just looking at the right rearview mirror, seeing that it was still staring at our truck, letting us drive away from it. My friend and I didn't say a word, and maybe about half an hour later, we drive out of the dark woods, and I said something like, well, weird things do happen in the woods. And my friend was suddenly extremely nervous, saying, yeah, did you see that? What the heck was that? We talked about it and he saw the same thing as me. He thought that he was hallucinating because we were very tired, but no, we both saw that thing in the woods. Today, he's in his 60s and I'm in my 30s and we are both still really haunted by whatever this thing was. We talk about it every time that we meet each other. He is particularly marked by the intelligence in its big yellow eyes. I'm an urbexer since like 2004. I visited the catacombs of Paris every few two months. I saw weird stuff during my explorations, but I've never feared anything like this. This, whatever it was, it honestly scares me. One day I actually found a picture on the internet. Sadly, I didn't find the artist and there was no context, but whatever it was, it looked a lot like what we saw that night, except for the eyes. The creature that I saw had big round yellow eyes, but apart from that, it was pretty much the spitting image. So when I was a kid, maybe six or seven, this was the mid-1990s, we took a family trip to the beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house a short walking distance from the beach. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay inside of my mother, but I wandered way down and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same and I really wasn't sure which one was ours, plus I couldn't see my mum anywhere. It started to rain and I came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house, only it didn't lead to a house at all but instead to a parking lot. There was a big dirty van parked there, it was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair, a hot pink tank top and those sort of big clunky thick glasses that were popular in the 80s, waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, oh my it's raining, where's your mummy? Let us take care of you, it's dangerous to be out here in the rain, you could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so in fact. In the driver's seat was a very overweight man without a shirt on, a hairy grey chest and some clunky looking gold chain. He was also wearing yellow tinted Elvis shades and staring at me intently. He was smoking a cigarette which I knew was bad. The woman stepped out of the van and kneeled down to me. She asked me how old I was. When I told her she gleefully remarked, oh my. We have two boys your age at our house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning we've got all types of cereal. Now, I had been taught all about stranger danger, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady continued talking about stuff like how the boys have go-karts and that they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old kid, and at this point, I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age. Then I remembered that I needed to ask my mum first. I told her this, and she told me that that was no problem, that they lived just up the road, but my mum shouldn't mind. It started raining harder, and she opened the sliding door of the van and said something like, now let's get you out of this rain and go find your mummy. I knew 
I knew logically that I really shouldn't do this, but the woman seemed really nice and I was desperately wanting to get out of the rain. As I walked toward the open door of the van, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head that something just wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked up at the fat man who was not only staring at me with this menacing glare, but he had this really creepy sort of toothy smile and his teeth were stained a really dark yellow. I could pick up on a very messed up vibe from him and I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor had changed now and she was being very demanding and trying to literally push me into the van. She sounded angry and said, get in already, in a tone that was the complete opposite of how she sounded before. I jumped to the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to quickly break free and run back to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was really overweight. I made it back to my mum who was freaking out. I tried to explain what had happened to me, but I just don't think that at seven years old, I was able to convey the gravity of what had actually happened to me and I didn't fully understand it myself. Needless to say, my mum never let me out of her view again after that. Just over 10 years ago, I was dating my first ever girlfriend. We had just gone public and came out to our parents officially. At the time I was 15 and she was 16 if memory serves. Both of us lived in pretty good households and went on to an accepting school. However, for whatever reason, when we went public, we had secretly dated for two years prior to that. She went fully off the deep end for our final year together. I'll quickly mention that she was really abusive throughout our entire relationship. I had just got out of an extremely abusive relationship, so I had a hard time recognizing the danger that I was in. It felt normal, I guess, but it got particularly bad this one night when she snapped, I guess. I'm hesitant to attribute her behavior solely to a psychotic breakdown because, quite honestly, I think that she was an evil person. So, to summarize the lead up to this quickly, she had recently, within about five months leading up to this, told me that she had seven souls living within her, all of which hated me. But they were all men from Victorian era or something, and she apparently had lost herself to these men, and as each one emerged, she would abuse me in a unique sort of way. I'm going to give them aliases, as this should help with understanding it all, even though they're not real. I'm still afraid of her and them, I guess. But Duke liked to choke me in my sleep. Harold hit me. Han would try to cut me with knives when I was sleeping. Theo would ignore me. Silent treatment. Gerald would force himself on me while sleeping. Tim would pick apart my appearance and bully me. But Alex? Alex was the worst. And the entity that I had to deal with the most towards the end. Alex was the present one this evening. He'd play paranormal activity and torment me with the creepiest stuff that he'd ever seen. For instance, he would sing in the corner of the room in the dark. He would mutter to himself constantly. He would smile at me while saying things like, you'll die soon, or you don't have to fear me when I'm unarmed. He was into knives and sharp things. He never self-harmed, but would try to harm me regularly. He also convinced me that if I ever left him, that he would kill me. I was 15 and I believed it. Now, you may be wondering at this point where our parents were in all of this. Well, my parents had just freshly divorced and custody was being settled. I stayed at my partner's place on the weekends and during some weekdays due to it being safer. Things were just really messed up in my own household that it genuinely seemed safer at the time. This is also where my hesitancy comes in with the legitimacy of their psychosis. Whenever their parents were around, they'd just snap out of it, literally like a light switch. They could turn the crazy off and on like it was nothing, which makes me think that they did this with the intention of harming me, not as a cry for help. Anyway, fast forward to the afternoon that had happened, my final straw. 
we were downstairs, Alex, or my girlfriend and myself, watching TV. Their parents were going to be out for the whole day, and upstairs was their older sibling, who was a complete hermit, kept to their room with soundproof headphones on, in fact. And well, Alex also hated this person for no real reason. I was sitting at the downstairs kitchen table working on some homework when I hear Alex start humming in the corner like usual. I turn around and ask if they're okay, but they do the creepy smile and nod thing. I went into freeze mode and just went back to my homework while keeping a close but discreet eye on them. It always got bad for me when I reacted, but I had a feeling that they were about to have a violent outburst for some reason. They started walking over to the kitchen, still humming, but there was a, a shake in their voice that I hadn't heard before. I looked up slowly and saw that they were taking a large paring knife out of the knife block. I remember my adrenaline started to kick in and I looked around for ways to defend myself. To my surprise, they started walking away from me, not towards me. I watched them walk down the hallway and towards the stairs before they exclaimed, I'm going to kill you, I presumed to their sibling. Something came over me at this point, and before I knew it, I was booking it up the stairs and trying to stop them as they started running knife in hand up the stairs. I grabbed their pant leg and pulled them down a few steps. We both collapsed as their sibling opened their bedroom door. It was a ways away because it was a huge house and asked what was going on. Alex, at this point, turned around and struck me with the knife, leaving a huge gash on my arm and shoulder. I retreated back downstairs as they calmly called out to their sibling. Nothing, just tripped. I'm okay, thanks. I ran to the kitchen downstairs, texted my parents to come and get me, and started cleaning and bandaging my arm as best as I could. Alex returned at this point, and as soon as we made eye contact, they dropped the knife walked into the kitchen, sat on the floor, and started singing to themselves while rocking back and forth. I was stunned, literally going into shock. I stared at them, bloody tissues in hand, and informed them that I was done with all of this and was going to wait outside for my parents. They began crying through the song that they were singing, still smiling like a maniac. But I never went back after that. I broke up with... I broke up with them over the phone about a week later. They sobbed and told me that they'd get rid of their souls and that she still loved me, but I didn't listen, just hung up and that was that. She even dropped out of school, which meant that I literally never saw her again after that. Years later though, I found out that she's dating this friend of hers that I also was familiar with as a teenager then found out that she was cheating on me with them for the entire time her and I dated. I've tried to feel bad for her for years, but honestly, I'm still healing from the several attempts at my life. And it's hard to feel bad for an abuser like that, let alone someone who attacks you with a knife. Anyway, it's good to get this off my chest. I've been in therapy for this recently, and I wanted to share it to kind of reflect on it also, I guess. If you have any questions or need any clarification, then do let me know. Be careful out there who you date, and if you see red flags, then please take them seriously, because otherwise you'll end up like I did. I'm really not even sure where to begin with this. I just wanted somewhere to talk about this with people who won't think that I'm crazy. I work at a, a school or daycare and I swear to you that there's a demon in it, or possibly several. As someone who has never had a for certain paranormal experience, this has been a hard pill to swallow. My belief was always more of a, oh well it could be real, and I am not enjoying finding out for sure. This is awful. It's terrifying and nerve-wracking and I want to throw up just thinking about going to work tomorrow. I'm searching for a new job as hard as I can, but it's slow going. So, it started with a particular toddler room called T5. 
Since I started working there, I've never liked going in there. Couldn't put my finger on why exactly, but I just hated T5. I thought that it was just that the kids were really out of control there, really mean and aggressive for toddlers, but it ended up being more than that. I was in there giving a break to their main teacher. I'm afloat, and all the kids were taking their nap like usual. The room was dark, no sound except for a quiet white noise machine. Then I heard something around the corner at the sink. The dishes started clinking like someone was doing the dishes. I looked around the corner and nothing was there. I sat back down and it started up again. I shrugged that one off, but the next time that I was there, the closet door opened by itself. I still tried to shrug it off. Other things were happening too, like I noticed that I was suddenly having a lot of weird health problems, mostly related to reproductive stuff. I was getting bad dizzy spells and double vision, but I didn't make the connection that it was only happening at work and only when I was in T5 or adjacent rooms. Then, another teacher who I'd become friends with mentioned offhand that she and her daughter, who also had worked there, had felt like the place had really negative energy. When I asked what she meant, she sort of tentatively admitted that she'd seen weird things. Without me telling her first, I asked her what she saw, and she also described dishes clinking, doors opening, hearing a deep voice speaking from the ceiling, and dizzy spells and other weird health stuff. She also told me, I don't have proof of this or anything, that her former co-teacher saw stuff too. She also had two unexplainable miscarriages while she worked there, and now that she quit, she's pregnant again and almost due with no complications. This teacher also told me that the former main teacher of T5 had been into occult stuff. I don't know if this is true or not. I only met her once and all I noticed was that she was a, a really sort of snappish and negative person who no one else really could stand. She quit a week after I started so I really didn't know her well. I do however know that three current teachers are also into occult stuff based on their social media posts. All three also bullied me and another teacher over here for being Christian. But after that, it got worse. I felt like I was being targeted, in fact, or attacked. I feel dizzy, like the floor is tilting, almost all the time when I'm in there. My body gets weirdly racked with pain that doesn't subside until I leave the building. This horrible dark depression comes over me, like life is pointless. I close my eyes and see glimpses of knives cutting my skin. During nap time when the kids are asleep is always when the thing really acts up. In T5, dishes clink every time, once the sink even turned on. Then whatever it was started knocking glasses on the floor. That one actually woke some of the kids up. Another day during a nap, I got my air cut off for about five seconds like something had me by the throat. Then. One of the almost two-year-olds pointed to the doorway of the classroom and nervously said, there's a ghost in there. She and another child often stare at something towards the ceiling and burst into uncontrollable crying and screaming. It sounds like claws are tapping on the glass window happening all the time and shadow figures glide past the big outside windows. The other day, Another teacher, who I had not talked to about any of this, nervously told me the bathroom door in her classroom closed itself and clicked locked, despite the fact that it scrapes on the floor and has to be pushed really hard to close. Prior to this, my work bestie, the only other religious employee, had been the only one to say that she'd seen stuff. She quit shortly after this too. Now a third teacher, not religious, had seen stuff as well. And last week, I saw it. It was like a, a black diamond shape in the air above the shoulder and a little bit behind a teacher standing in the hallway. The shape was kind of like a, a cloak draped, but mostly just a black mass with blurry edges. The head wasn't really describable, I guess, but the closest thing would be a cross between a vulture skull and a plague doctor mask. I only saw it for a second and jumped out of my skin, but I know that I saw it. It's worth noting too that the teacher that it was behind is a horrible person. 
who probably shouldn't really even be working with kids. And he has a weird mood swing thing going on and alternates between hitting on female teachers and acting aloof and yells at the kids a lot as well. Today, I was supervising napping kiddos in an older classroom. That class has an autistic boy who is not very verbal. He was sound asleep and I was sitting in a chair between him and the bathroom when I suddenly began to feel really cold and the familiar I'm being watched feeling so I knew something was in there. Then I heard things being scooted around in the bathroom. It was quiet enough not to wake up the kids sleeping right by the bathroom, but the little non-verbal boy suddenly woke up, pointed at something, and absolutely screamed. He isn't like that at all. I ran and hugged him and said, get out at the thing. It took a few minutes, but the feeling faded and the little boy laid back down. So, I've gotten enough confirmation about this that I'm convinced now that it's real. And my question for all of you is, how do you deal with this? I feel traumatized and honestly, I just hate this. I can only talk about it for sure with the one teacher, but everyone in the building acts dark and sort of depressed. I'm having night terrors now, anxiety attacks are increasing just from having to go to work and be around this. If other people weren't experiencing it too, I would think that I was going insane, but others have, and the kids see stuff as well. Plus, I only experience stuff at work, never anywhere else. Everything is fine as soon as I'm not in the building. So, please let me know if you've seen something like this before, if you know what it is, and if you have any advice that you can give me of how to deal with the fear then that would be much appreciated. Also, I just found out yesterday that the bully teacher is completely getting away with everything. She even convinced the mum of the student that I was lying, even though two other teachers had also come forward with the same information. And I was just told that because I just answered a parent's question honestly, I'm no longer allowed to be a floater. I am to be kept contained in one classroom so that I don't interact with the other staff or expose them to anything else. My boss literally used the word kept contained. I'm just so floored by this whole thing and I'm desperately applying for other jobs as fast as I can. In the late 90s, I accompanied my mum to England so that she could see where her grandparents had lived. I was basically there to look after her because my dad didn't want to come and my mum has a hard time doing things for herself. Our agreement was that after spending a week in England, the second week we would spend in Ireland. But my mum is terrible at planning so we ended up spending a week sort of in limbo in Liverpool waiting for the Irish Sea to calm down so that we could cross on a ferry. It was September which is probably the worst month to try and cross here and we never made it to Ireland in the end. Anyways, for five days I had to try to find places for us to sleep at because she also made no hotel reservations for our entire two week stay and I was completely unaware of this until we were already in England. I picked a hotel that seemed okay and my mum paid to sleep in a different room because she has really bad RLS and shakes violently at night. It keeps everybody up. In the middle of the night I heard a man yelling in the hallway though. He had to have been very intoxicated. He was pounding on the doors all the way down the hall and hitting the walls. Being the punk kid that I was, I made the mistake of acknowledging his rage by telling him to shut up. This really enraged him. He started beating on the door, screaming that he was going to kill me. He tried the doorknob and thank god those doors had an automatic lock. I started looking around the room and realized that this hotel has no phones in the room. Like I said, this was the 90s. I went to the window, but I was three floors up and windows didn't open either. So I just stayed there, listening as he did his best to break the door down while threatening what he was going to do to me once he opened the door. And this went on for at least 20 minutes. Somehow I finally fell asleep and when I woke up the next morning, I saw just how much damage he had actually done. 
he smashed in my door with a fire extinguisher that he had apparently pulled off the wall nearby. There were dents and marks all down the hall where he had dragged it violently from end to end. The worst part was my mum down the hall never said anything. When I told the clerk as we were checking out, he looked at me like I was crazy and making it up. I told him to just go and look. Later I asked my mum about it and she said, Oh yes, I, I thought I heard you screaming. Was that you crying for help? When I was 14, I worked at a McDonald's that was connected to a gas station. It was a truck stop basically, so it was very busy 90% of the time. The only downside to working at a, a truck stop fast food place was that the bathroom was on the complete other side of the building. Now, I was a freshman in high school. At the time, I was pretty small. Maybe not in height, but certainly in size. I was around 5'6 and anywhere from like 130 to 150 pounds. Not super tiny, but small enough to where I'd probably have made an easy target. This wasn't really a fear of mine, however, but maybe, maybe it should have been. I remember that I was in gym class. It was maybe the middle of the school day and it was one of those days where we could just sit on the side and catch up on work for other classes if we didn't want to participate in the game. My friends and I did this almost all the time anyway and almost never actually worked on anything important. We were laughing, joking around until I received power school notifications, my school iPad excusing me from the remaining classes of the day. I was really confused by this, considering that my mum hadn't mentioned anything about picking me up so early, and I was only seeing my dad every other weekend, and he wasn't the type to pick me up from school. I was grounded, so I didn't have a phone with me, other than a, a cheap flip phone that my mum had gotten me from Walmart. I texted her about the notifications, but before I got a response back from her, my gym teacher told me that I needed to grab my things and go to the office because my mum would be picking me up. This confused me even more and I shot my mum another text asking if she was picking me up from school. She freaked out though and told me not to leave the building. At this point I was sitting in the office by the window waiting for apparently nobody to come and pick me up until the situation was figured out. My mum ended up calling the school and letting them know that I wasn't allowed to leave with anyone that day. Apparently, whoever called claiming to be my mum and said that they were coming to pick me up wasn't actually her. As far as I know, nobody ever showed up to pick me up and I didn't hear anything else about it. But my mum wasn't comfortable with me working at a truck stop and we got my location switched to a McDonald's that was closer in town and wasn't connected to a gas station. Because what we think might have happened is someone saw my name tag and possibly called all the schools in the area until they found me. I still have no idea how they would have known my last name, but with that said, it was a, a creepy experience and I'm really glad that I texted my mum that day because if I hadn't, quite honestly, I probably would have just walked out. This is the recount of my first ghost encounter that turned me from a non-believer and a skeptic to, well, eventually a believer. The first event was highly peculiar due to the strange things that, looking back, were probably a precursor for the actual encounter. I was around 15 at the time, if that's of interest, and at that time, I was a non-believer like I said. I was invited to stay at my, at the time, sister-in-law's parents' house to meet them for the first time. This was around the time Borderlands came out and I had played that game endlessly and beat it several times. Since I was going to stay there for about three days, I brought my 360 and Borderlands with me. The room that I was going to stay in was fairly small and had a mini pool table, treadmill, bed and a tall dresser with a TV atop. There was no door to the room. Just the doorway which they kept main hallway light on throughout the night and carpeted floor. The light in the hallway would bleed into the room and slightly give light on the immediate wall to the right as you enter. 
that to the right of the dresser, there was a treadmill that had some clothing draped over the panel. The mini pool table was to the left as you entered and served as a nightstand for the small twin-sized bed in the room where I placed my iPod Touch and an empty bag of Doritos. So, around 11pm as I was playing Borderlands solo, while in voice chat with a friend, as I was playing, the clothing on the treadmill kept looking like it was moving or changing shape. This happened three times before I mentioned it to my friend, which I laughed off. The logical explanation is that I was playing on a bright TV in a dark room and anything that I was not visually focused on will look like it was doing lots of stuff due to the light refraction or whatever. Just your mind playing tricks on you. And I was trying to come to a conclusion of the information that I was being given by whatever was around me. After we laughed about it, the clothing stopped seemingly morphing and nothing out of the ordinary happened shortly after that. About an hour passed and the clothing started to morph again, but this time it was appearing more defined. Though as I would look at the clothing, it would still appear to be there for a quick moment, but sort of then return to normal. Five minutes or so passed and without any morphing, moving or anything, it looked like all of a sudden there was an owl perched on the panel of this treadmill. I could feel it looking at me and I could sort of see it out of the peripheral of my eye. I stopped controlling my character and tried to focus on this owl without directly looking at it using peripheral vision. It remained there looking directly at me. Without closing my eyes or losing mental focus, I looked directly at it and whatever it was, it remained there for a couple of seconds, then quickly faded into the clothing again. I immediately told my friend how the clothing was looking seriously like an actual owl at this point and he didn't say anything back. I asked if he was still there and if he could hear me but still nothing. If you've played any 360 then you know that it makes a sound and brings on the guide overlaid on the game. I pressed the guide button to check to see if it was still in the voice chat. The sound played as if the guide was opened and the game went semi-dark as it does when the menu pops up. But the menu guide didn't populate. I couldn't control the game nor could I close or get out of what was supposed to be that guide. All that I could hear was the ambient sound of the game but no music or anything, just the sounds of the wind blowing. Trying to unfreeze the game, I pressed all the buttons on the controller several times in hopes that something would happen, but nothing worked. I was giving it a moment in hopes that it would unfreeze on its own. Then there was a dialogue that I had never heard before. Again, at that point, I'd beaten the game several times on all difficulties and heard every bit of NPC dialogue that you can imagine. But the first line was, you don't belong here, in a deep voice that was how some of the larger NPCs sounded, which my hair stood on end. But there was about a five second gap before the second dialogue occurred, which was, you don't want to be here. And once it finished, the guide popped up and I saw that my friend was still in the party. I immediately asked him if he heard anything that I said, and he said that he didn't hear me say anything. Now, I cannot stress enough how I had invested hundreds of hours at this point and a few hundred after, and not a single time had I ever heard that dialogue occur before or after this isolated event. In fact, I tried over and over again to get it to happen again, but it just never did. When I told my friend about what had just happened, we both agreed that it was creepy, but even then, as I was indeed a, a little startled about the events leading up to this and including the unheard dialogue, I still did not entertain the idea of ghosts or anything of the sorts. I just thought that it was all really strange. After this, though, it didn't take long for me to fall asleep, which was restful and without dreams. My sleep was mildly interrupted by what sounded like the snack-sized bag of Doritos being crumpled in somebody's hand. I thought that it was my mother-in-law doing some cleaning early in the morning or something and remained half asleep with my back facing the rest of the room. As I'm laying there with my eyes closed and trying to go back to sleep, the sound of the crumpling bag didn't stop after what felt like an entire minute. I was now starting to become closer to being fully awake and slightly annoyed, 
since it felt like it was really early in the morning. A static-like sound began to irritate me and I thought to myself, what the heck, why is she messing up with the empty bag forever like that? At this point, I'm fully awake, but with my eyes closed, facing the wall while the sound persisted. I reached the point that I would turn over to find out what exactly could she be doing, making this noise while I was sleeping like this. I opened my eyes, looking at the wall, tuning into the sound with my mind, entertaining out of frustration the possibilities as to what she could be doing. I turn over from my left side to my right to see the room still dark, with the light from the hallway bleeding into the room giving light to the closet doors on the far side of the room, and in the matter of what felt like maybe five seconds total, I saw this dark hooded person sort of shape standing immediately to the side of the bed. The wall, closet and other junk were somewhat visible through this person, which I was only then, the first two seconds, seeing the hip and chest of this figure, which had a sort of slight transparency about it, around what would be maybe 50-60% to 60 opaqueness. Realizing though that this figure was actually in front of me, I began to look up towards its face. There were no distinctive features where a face would have been, it was just as black and shadowy as the rest of its body though it had a very similar shape making its head appear to be sort of hooded, a loosely fitted one I guess. While I couldn't see the face, I felt and saw it not looking forward towards the wall but instead directly down at me, staring at me as I just stared at it. The time that it took to look up at its face was maybe about a second, the staring took the final two seconds of the encounter. My eyes began to widen as my mind couldn't make an immediate logical sense of this, more so the transparency of this humanoid shaped figure clearly looking directly at me, and when the feeling of fright began to spread through my body, the figure, at a sprinting pace, left the room through the doorway. I watched this figure leave the room, following the length of the room, to execute a flawless 90 degree turn through the doorway. Like, it's hard to explain, but it was as if it was on some sort of track or something. It never sped up or slowed down. The speed was absolutely phenomenal and immediate. As it moved, there was no sound, no footsteps or anything. It was completely quiet after the crumpling stopped when I met its face, so even after seeing what I saw, I still evaluated with fear that if there was any bit of logic or sense to this... I would have at the very least heard footsteps of it running out of the room. But there was no sound, nothing, not even a whooshing of the wind or anything. I remained looking at the closet and then to the doorway in disbelief for about maybe five seconds, after which the fear spread through my chest and throughout the rest of my body and finally met my head. Fear immediately overcame me. I flipped over and threw the blanket over my head this had me so frightened that I couldn't do anything but hide underneath the blanket with my heart pounding and my mind just racing. I wanted to further prove to myself that this wasn't just a dream or sleep paralysis or anything, and to at least know the time so that I could at least have a sense of timeline and all that, and more importantly, see how much time was left before daybreak. As I lay there attempting to overcome my fear of just grabbing my iPod from the mini pool table for what felt like 30 minutes, with my eyes clamped shut, I rolled over as quickly as I could with my arm reached out blindly and frantically patting the table feeling for the iPod. Once I grabbed it, I rolled over and went back under the covers and looked at the time displayed on the screen. The time was 5.55am, which really has no significant meaning to me personally other than the sheer coincidence that all the digits were the same and this meant that there were only around 30 minutes until the sun would start to light up the windows of the room. I remained completely awake for the remainder of that morning into the day. As the rest of the house began their morning routines and breakfast began, I joined my brother at the table. He asked me how I slept and I hesitantly started to give him just the core details that I saw, a shadow figure standing over me and how it left the room without making a sound. And he said that 
Yeah, her parents say this place has a ghost in it that lives here as well. Being my older brother, I simply thought that he was making a joke at my expense to mess with me, which is why I didn't expand on any of the other details. He insisted, though, that I tell his mother-in-law about my encounter. Embarrassed, though, I declined, since I still felt like he was just messing with me. After everyone had joined the table and begun eating with the traditional morning conversation going on, my brother spoke out to his mother-in-law that I had seen something that evening. Not wanting to appear to be a fool, I stated that I had not seen anything. However, he pressed it, and his mother-in-law doubled down on my brother's claim that she had told him that a spirit lived in that house. To try to move on from this, I folded and told them even less than I did my brother and just said that I had seen a dark figure that was sort of semi-transparent looking down at me. There was some light questioning as I think that they had started to get the message that I really wasn't open to speaking much more about it, such as, was it a woman, was it wearing a dress, but as I just said, it didn't feel male or female and appeared to be hooded and in black. In any case, this event certainly moved me from a non-believer to be a, a bit of a skeptic, I guess, on the topic of ghosts and spirits. Luckily, this was my final evening there and I went back home later that day. No other events happened once I had left there, at least not for a few years later, but that's literally a few other recounts as lengthy as this one, which perhaps I'll get into another time. In any case, I didn't experience anything like this again in that place after that, and for that, honestly, I'm grateful. So, I'm a person with pretty long hair, but not female, nor trans. And there's a girl in my university class last year that had the same hair color as me, black and long. She is quite popular and usually gets asked out a lot. Sometimes people confuse me with her due to us both having long black hair, a similar height and similar hair length. In fact, she would sometimes tease me about having to worry about such long hair, but that's off topic. So, one night in February, I finished my work and packed up since there was this term break coming up. It was getting a little dark out, but I figured that a single kilometre walk to a friend's house wouldn't be too dangerous. I used to play a bunch of sports in high school, so I feel like the close proximity to the campus, as well as my own personal strength, I would be able to defend myself for just an hour. Canada, where I live, is pretty safe anyway, as many of you might know, so I walked on. It was around 10.30 when I started walking. Tons of students already left the campus beforehand, so there wasn't a lot of people traveling with me. Those who were probably just decided to spend another night anyway. My hometown is in British Columbia and my university was pretty far away, so I needed to board a plane to go back. And about 800 meters of walking later, I felt the presence of someone walking behind me. Suddenly, he put his arm around my neck and started choking me. It took me a second to realize what was going on and the person was choking me really hard. I can feel my jugular vein expanding due to the lack of space for blood to go through. I kicked him in such a way that made his knee bend forward and he started falling to the ground. I back kicked him in the nuts which is when he let go a little. Then I got out of his arms and started punching his face. In my adrenaline filled moment, I thought that he was going to attack me again, so I punched him a few times to make sure that he wouldn't get up. I ran away and I called the police. Thankfully, I was okay with no damage. The guy who grabbed me was apparently a stalker though, and had allegedly confused me for the girl that I mentioned earlier. He was arrested, however, I don't really know what happened to him, although he did get charged with assault apparently and stalking. However, my memory is a little bit fuzzy around all the details because it was a little while ago. In any case, I'm kind of glad that it was me and not her that got attacked that night because, quite honestly, if it was her, I don't know if she would have made it out. When I was little, I slept walked often. 
things like running to my parents' room while they were on the couch or just standing in the middle of my room in the middle of the night. Though, one story that my sister was the victim of, it really sticks out the most. My sister already thought that the house was haunted, so she thought that my sleepwalking meant that I was possessed. One night she was up late playing games and had looked over, and apparently I was just laying on my back with my eyes open looking at the ceiling. My sister called for me, but of course, since I was asleep, I had no answer. Though, as she was creeped out by this, she put the covers over her head and decided to just go to sleep. After a while, she woke up later in the night. She said that I was sitting straight up, staring straight ahead. My sister was afraid, so she yelled at me and once again went under the covers. After falling asleep once again, she woke up one last time. She again ripped the covers off of her head, though when she did, the first thing that she saw was me staring straight down at her, standing at the end of her bed. She said that she had ran out to our parents' room, people who had often witnessed my sleepwalking. But when they went to check on me, they said that I was perfectly sleeping in my bed like nothing happened. Interestingly enough, after this, they cleansed the house, and that was officially the last time that I ever slept walked. When I was young, we used to live in a house that had a big sloping backyard that backed down into a big oval. Our fence line was along one end. The other was a big forest that went on for miles, and on the opposite side was a fence line and all the housing estates. Right smack bang in the middle of this field was play equipment. Uh, there were zero people around here as it was quite isolated, and not many people frequented this oval. But me and my sister, we used to run down our sloping backyard, jump the fence and run across to the play equipment almost every day. One day though, we went out and we were playing as usual, having loads of fun. I remember climbing to the top of the equipment and sitting there with my sister. As we looked forward though, we were facing the forest side, probably maybe 100 or 200 meters away. There was a row of bushes along the front of the entrance to the forest. But out of nowhere, something caught my eye. It looked like a, a black object bobbed up and down quickly. I told my sister and we started watching that area waiting. Then, clear as day, we saw two people poke their heads up completely dressed in black, head to toe, with what I recognize today as possibly balaclavas or hoodies. My sister and I sat there frozen, but this went on for several minutes as they watched us. We made the decision to bolt as fast as we could towards our left, which was our fence line. I ran as fast as I think I ever run straight to the fence, jumped it, and ran straight up the backyard and into our house. This day, me and my sister always mention the people in black, and I get shivers. Maybe it was some people playing a prank, but I doubt it. It just seemed like such an isolated area, and no one would have seen us if a struggle had broken out, but the distance between the forest line would have given us a good chance to run had they attempted anything. We used to go down there every day, so it creeps us out to think about how long they may have been planning this if... It wasn't just some elaborate prank. So this was about seven years ago and I still remember these instances quite well. They left an imprint in my mind, I guess. I was 13, living in an apartment with my mom and older sister. I'd always loved supernatural things and for some dumb reason thought that it would be so fun and cool of me to make a Ouija board and use it. I only ever did it when I was home alone, and I remember that I always lit candles. It seemed like a, a fun activity to me, that if anything were to happen, it would either be someone or thing helping me, or just wanted to be in contact with this side of the world for some reason. I did never really experience anything with the board, no movement, nothing. Though my candles would flicker in a weird way sometimes. Anyway, fast forward a couple of days, and I wake up with a a weird bite mark on my arm that definitely wasn't there the night before. It seemed like it was an impression of a bite made with wax of some sort. Weird, I know. 
though my candles were always white and this was a sort of dark caramel color. It was sticky to the touch and it was gross. I remember having to get ready for school and leaving it due to the rush, though at some point I managed to wash it off. Things seemed pretty normal to be honest, well other than the occasional shadow that I would see move out of the corner of my eye, but for a while I thought it was nothing. But one night, I suddenly wake up to my foot being scratched along the bottom, enough to bleed. Not a lot of blood, but torn skin was definitely apparent. My foot had been hanging off the bed and there was just nothing, nothing around at all that could have caused it. Anyways, we moved out of that apartment and when we did, it all stopped. No more dark shadows, no more bite marks, no scratches, nothing. I really don't know if that's that reassuring too because what it tends to suggest is that whatever I was experiencing in that house was real. When I was 20, I took a job as a direct care worker at a group home for adults with developmental disabilities. The home that I worked in had six residents all of which had several physical and mental impairments. None of the residents had the ability to walk or communicate. They were all tube-fed and needed 24-hour care and supervision. I worked the midnight shift from 10pm to 6am. When I arrived for my shift, the residents were already tucked into bed. It was, overall, a pretty boring job if I'm being honest. I worked with one other person and we cleaned the house and stocked up on supplies while they slept. Every two hours, we would check the residents' briefs and change them as necessary. We also had two medications to pass during our shift, and in the last hour, we would give two residents showers. Now, one night, my co-worker and I were just settling in for our shift. I started a pot of coffee and we chatted. It was around 10.30pm. We had baby monitors in the residents' rooms and in the kitchen so we could hear them if they were in distress. And suddenly... We heard our resident, her name was Rachel, through the monitor. She was coughing and gagging uncontrollably. My co-worker and I jumped up because we knew what was happening. Rachel had been congested that week and she didn't have the ability to roll over herself. This happened several times in the past as well and it was always a serious situation. The excessive coughing could cause her to vomit in which case she would pretty much aspirate and die. We tended to Rachel immediately, rolling her on her side and using a special suction machine to clear her mouth out. Sure enough, she had vomited quite a bit and we had gotten to her just in time. After a while, her coughing ceased and her breathing returned to normal. We cleaned her up, changed her clothes and bedding and made sure that she was propped up better with pillows. Adrenaline was still pumping through us as the whole situation was a bit frightening for a couple of 20-year-olds with minimal medical training. We agreed though that we would check on Rachel frequently for the rest of the night and write an incident report. My co-worker and I left the resident area and headed back toward the common room. I was definitely ready for my coffee at this point and she was ready for a cigarette. She headed outside and I went to fill up my cup. That's when I noticed that the lights on the coffee pot weren't on. That's weird I thought. It's plugged in and I hadn't tripped the breaker. I started pouring my cup and I realized that it was ice cold. That didn't make sense to me at all. I mean, I had just started the coffee less than an hour ago. Why wasn't it at least warm? I rolled my eyes figuring that something must be wrong with the coffee pot. I dumped it out and went to start again when my co-worker barged through the back door. Her eyes were huge. A little startled, I asked her what was wrong. She asked me if I had looked at the clock yet. I immediately looked up and saw that it now read 5.30am. Before I could make sense of things, she shoved her cell phone in my face, which also read 5.30am. We couldn't have been with Rachel longer than 45 minutes, though. But somehow, we had lost around 7 hours. Neither of us could make sense of it. We walked back into the back of the house and walked out seven hours later without time feeling like it had passed at all. We hadn't given out meds, done bed checks, given showers or cleaned anything. 
The next shift was coming in half an hour and it felt like we had just arrived. We did our best to pull it together and at least make it look like we had worked all night. When the next shift arrived, we just sat at the table silently and then we left. We never told any of our co-workers about the experience because, well, would you believe it? It sounded crazy, right? If I hadn't have experienced it myself, I wouldn't believe it either. My co-worker and I lost touch eventually as we both moved on to other jobs. We recently found each other on social media and she sent me a message and asked me about that day. And our memories of the event are exactly the same. Nothing like that has ever happened to either of us again. And I have no idea what happened in those seven hours that apparently just zipped by. I do know that there was never a problem with the coffee pot as well. It just timed out after four hours and shut itself off. So my friend and I had a really bizarre experience in a bushwalk and we haven't really been able to wrap our heads around it. So I'm curious to see if anyone here has any ideas about what happened to us or what we may have encountered. But we're both pretty experienced bushwalkers. We were pretty confident that we'd be fine on the trail, even though it's not the most well-marked or heavily used trail, and we'd never hiked it before either. But we left at 8am and told family members where we were going and that we planned to be back around maybe 4pm at the latest. About two hours into our walk was the first sign that something was off. We couldn't get our GPS to work correctly. It was showing us as being in a completely different area to where we were. This was weird, but it wasn't a big deal since we did have a map. But at about uh, maybe 1pm is when things got really strange. We had stopped to check the map. And my friend said, hey, I think we took a wrong turn back there somewhere. Then we both sort of felt off balance for a few seconds. And it was then dark. I mean, it was like the sun went out. When we checked the time, it was 5.41pm. Which means that we had apparently been standing in this one place for almost five hours of time. We also started hearing this weird heavy breathing from the direction that we had been walking towards. It sounded like a maybe a person breathing right next to us, but we couldn't see anyone. And when we called out, there was never any response. We live in Australia, so we didn't have to worry about any large predators or anything. But you hear stories about weirdos who hang out in the bush and murder backpackers and stuff like that, so that was obviously on our minds. We were both extremely unnerved to say the least, and we just didn't feel comfortable moving towards the breathing noise. And on top of that, we agreed that we had made a wrong turn somewhere, so... We turned and walked the way that we came. We considered calling for help on our satellite phone, but we decided that we'd at least try and backtrack to where we'd lost our way and go from there before calling for help. But the breathing, it followed us as we walked. We were both feeling dizzy, we were convinced that we were being followed by a serial killer and we were too scared to stop and try to call for help believing that if we alerted whoever was following us that help was on the way that it would prompt them to attack. Eventually, I was just too dizzy to continue as well, so we ended up stopping and called for help. We were instructed to stay where we were and wait for the rescue, but the breathing sound wasn't going away, so we kept moving back towards where we thought that we'd left the trail whenever I was well enough to walk for a few minutes. The breathing, though, it followed. Eventually, too, we found a, a set of stairs that was marked on the map, so we were able to more accurately tell rescuers where we were. And I fainted while waiting for the rescuers. My friend tells me that the breathing not only continued, but sounded like it was circling us. He said that there were never any sounds of footsteps or any indication that there was anyone there, except for the breathing, of course. She admitted that by the time the SES arrived, she was hysterical. We were both rescued without any physical injuries. The source of the breathing, our dizziness, and our lost time was never identified, and it was pretty much brushed off as just the product of panicked brains. Even our families didn't believe us. 
They thought that we'd just gotten lost and had been too embarrassed to call for help. Shortly after this happened though, she told me that she was having nightmares about the breathing sound and the dizziness and the sense of unease she felt. She mentioned that she didn't feel like she ever wanted to go bushwalking or camping again and to my knowledge she never did after that too. And that was pretty much the last time that I heard from her for like over two years until a few weeks ago when she reached out to me to catch up. We had a short chat but we didn't mention this incident. Tragically, a week later, she took her own life. I don't know how much our experience played a part in her mental health. I know that there are always many factors in this sort of thing and it would be silly to think that I could have prevented it, but I feel really guilty that I didn't try to stay in contact with her. No one else believed her about what happened and I know that that affected her a lot. In the end, I really don't know if I'll ever have closure about what happened to us and how, if at all, it contributed to her death. I guess I'm just wondering if this experience sounds familiar to anyone, if anyone has heard of anything like this. So me and my sister and my mum have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday, I, a 17 year old male, was home alone while my family, besides my sister, 21 who was at work, stayed in their cabin a few kilometres away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario is pretty common in the summertime especially while I'm working and I can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I think I'm just used to the odd creaks and settling noises of the old house now. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him. And if anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the door or the windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12am were disconcerting to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I'm still pretty afraid of the premise of break-in or that some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. So I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long, and I finally got out of bed, I sleep in the basement, and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door, I was comforted for a moment until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep, and saw the door open about two or three inches. I froze. I had let Bosco the dog out earlier that night, but I know that I closed that door. I've never left this door open, in fact. I mean, I'm a paranoid person with pretty bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins, like I said so I would never, ever, home alone, forget to close the door. I'm 100% certain of that. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open because I knew it would send me into a spiral, possibly even into an anxiety or panic attack if I didn't explain this away. So I closed the locked door, double-checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, the lights were all off, I looked around the entire second floor of the three-floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease, and upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. Now, as I was down there trying to push away the fear, I could hear Bosco walking around on the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought that I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about maybe 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2am that same night, my sister comes back home from work. I woke up a few minutes before this to Bosco in the basement, 
which he never does. There's even a gate to stop him from getting to the basement, in fact, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in, and we let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days, and forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. My sister and my mum were both home with me for a movie night, while my dad and my brothers stay at the cabin. I remember the door situation when we were packing our horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a, a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again. The same door that was locked from the inside, and not opened since, earlier that night. My stomach immediately dropped, and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. I mean, maybe she had let Boss go out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason that someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then, this hypothetical person would be trapped up there, not knowing that this house, that appears empty with the rest of my family gone and all the lights off, was not empty and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister was in the bathroom, they ran out the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I found it, as they were in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open too the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, it ties together too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing or just breaking and enterings many, many times. So, it's not as unlikely as it may be in the bigger city. I still can't really make sense of it though, and I am definitely shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There's a part of me that just doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is. I moved out of state to a very small town first day of moving in, a neighbor walking his dog greets me and introduces himself to me, gives me a quick rundown that the neighborhood is filled with tweakers and the other shady types. I took that as a general warning that that may be all that I'll deal with here. A few months later, he invited me over to his place to teach me how to do some woodwork. As we're making a shelf for my cat to sit on, he's asking me questions. To me, they were normal everyday questions, but Looking back, I realize now that he was trying to get information out of me. Why did you move out of here from out of state? Who lives with you? Do you have any other family members in the states or any other area? Once we were done, we went to install the shelf and he met my mom who stays with me. He talks to her for a bit and then we left to walk back to his place. He starts telling me that he can see our yard from his place and notices that I barely go outside with my dogs. Told me not to worry that if someone breaks into our place that we can see them and shoot them from his room. That's when I was thinking, how is that possible because you live over half a block away? Before I can question him, he asks if I want to see more of the town. I'm like, yeah, let's go. He walks to his car and pulls something out from the middle compartment and then tells me to go into his pickup truck. So I do while he's filling up the gas tank up with gasoline. But once he's done, he walks to the driver's side and opens the door and drops a, a holster between us. He tells me not to worry about it as I look trying to see if it has a gun or not. As we're driving, I realize that he actually hasn't said a word for five minutes. And this guy loves to hear his own voice. Another thing that I noticed is that 
we're on a dirt road and haven't seen a single house, trailer or vehicle for a while now. I guess I gave off some nervous vibes too because he suddenly goes, so yeah, unless you know where you're going out here, you'll get lost. And it's best to have a pickup or an ATV to drive out here. After another 10 minutes of silent driving, we get to a little creek. Luckily, there was another truck there. And all he says is, oh, look at that. Someone else is here with us. And he grabs the holster and gets out. We both see a lady with a big dog playing in the water. She turns to us as she sees him walking closer to her. She gestures to her holster and he tells her not to worry that it's for the snakes. She lifts her shirt above her waist to show her gun and she tells him that she's not worried one bit. They talk for a few minutes and she tells him that her husband is home waiting for her to make her dinner and she's just out letting the dogs have some playtime. The neighbor changes his tone and posture from confident to defensive now. She called her dog and they went to their truck. He's watching her and she hasn't started her truck yet minutes pass and he tells me that I guess it's time that we go to and when we get to his truck she drives off the drive back though I start to get uneasy and creeped out I mean why would he drive me all the way out there just to leave why tell me not to worry about the holster gun but tell the lady what it's for I finally get out of my head and I just break the silence and give him my life story as, as to why I moved Finally, he responds that he can relate to my story and gives me the rundown of how the town is and what it's about, and that some people are more racist than others and I should watch my back for that. Once we get back to his place, I tell him that I have stuff to take care of at home and I just nope the heck out of there. I said to myself that if I'm ever going to hang out with that guy again, that it definitely won't be alone. So, I want to share a, a strange experience that I had in my house. I've lived in this house since the beginning of 2013 and never experienced anything before. This happened a couple of months ago. It actually makes me feel kind of sick as well to think about it, but anyway, I was sitting at my kitchen table in my usual spot. My six-year-old daughter was on the second floor of my house in the upstairs living room, more or less right above my head. She was loudly shifting through her Lego box of something, and to my left at the table is the underside of the staircase to the second floor. I can't see who was on the stairs, or the top or the bottom of the stairs from where I was sitting. If you were descending the stairs, the door to the room that we used as an office is directly to the right, across a short hallway from the bottom of the stairs. From my chair at the table, I can see the entire hallway between the bottom of the stairs and the door to the office. I can also see a sliver of the interior of the office. So, as I was sitting at the table and semi-listening to the noise my daughter was making with Legos, I heard someone start walking down the stairs. I wasn't really looking towards the office, but I saw the back of my daughter's head as she walked into the office. Well, so I thought. A few seconds later, though, I heard someone start walking down the stairs, this time louder than the first time that I heard it. I realized that something odd had just happened, so I looked towards the hallway and I watched as my daughter walked into the office with both her hands full of her Lego creations. I hurried over to the office and looked inside, but my daughter was the only one in there. She was putting her Legos on one of the desks, and so I asked her if she came down to the office and went back and came back down again, but she said that she hadn't. There wasn't enough time for her to go upstairs again to be honest and come back down again anyway and also I would have seen her come out of the office. I didn't see the face of the first daughter to go into the office but the height appeared about right. It was the same hair color and length and shirt color were correct for my daughter. I am thoroughly creeped out by this. As creeped out as I was when my daughter used to wave and say goodbye to her closet when we would get her up from naps in the morning when she was around too. I'm really unsure of what to make of this. I lived in this house with shadow people when I was my daughter's age and really don't want to deal with anything creepy ever again. So 
I'm currently sharing this because I'm just too scared to sleep after what happened about two hours ago. So, I, a 22-year-old female, am a dog sitter. And I stay in my clients' homes instead of keeping their dogs at my own house. I'm currently on a job and have been for about a week. Ever since the first night I got here, I felt super unsettled to be in the house by myself at night. I don't think that there was any reason to be because the house is in a gated neighborhood in a decent part of town. It's right next to a freeway, so fairly busy streets outside of the neighborhood. I figured that it was just because of all the antiques in the house, making it feel sort of like haunted mansion-esque. Anyway, the house that I'm staying in is kind of uh, on the outskirts of the gated community, I guess you could say. It's in a little cul-de-sac with no neighbors to either side or behind. There's also a pedestrian gate to come in or out of the neighborhood right next to this house. And yesterday, when I was leaving for work in the morning, I noticed that the pedestrian gate was wide open. I figured that someone went for a walk or something and made a note to see if it was still open when I got back in the afternoon. I figured that someone went for a walk or something and made a note to see if it was still open when I got back in the afternoon. Sure enough, it was still open and I went over to close it. The gate, however, was in a locked position, so the little lock bar was in place, so... It couldn't latch closed. The bar would block it. I didn't have a key to this gate too, so I was unable to unlock it in order to close it and relock it. Yesterday night after that, I just had the worst gut feeling that something was going to happen too. Now, I have severe anxiety, so often just write things off as that. A bad trait to have as someone who regularly stays in houses all by myself, I know. But anyway... I finally got to sleep last night and everything was fine. Today was normal and I was home from work all day so I didn't leave the house. I should mention too that this house has a gated courtyard out front. I keep it locked all the time so there's nowhere to get into the front or backyards of the house unless I let you in or if you jump the wall or something. Around 9.45pm tonight I had just gotten into bed with the pup that I'm dog sitting and was about to fall asleep when... I heard someone start knocking hard on either a door or a window of the house. There are about five sliding glass doors leading to either the courtyard, backyard or side yard and I couldn't identify exactly which way it was coming from. The dog of course went crazy and the knocking immediately stopped. Like I said before though, there's no way to get to the house with that courtyard gate locked. so. Whoever was knocking had to have hopped a wall into either the front courtyard or backyard. And if it was a neighbor or something like that, the dog shouldn't have scared them into stopping. I was obviously pretty terrified and called my mum who told me to call the police and she and my stepdad headed out to come over. They live like 10 or 15 minutes away from where I'm staying. The police dispatcher was a woman who totally understood how I felt and told me to stay in the bathroom and if any knocking happened again before the officers got there to call back. After I hung up with the police, I tried to call my mum back, but my phone suddenly had zero bars of signal, which was just the terrifying cherry on top of all of this. The police came and checked out the perimeter, didn't see anything suspicious, and so they left. But the part that really scares me is that it had been raining this evening, so... I was reading with my bedroom sliding glass door open before bed. I usually go to bed later but wanted to sleep early tonight so I was reading with my door wide open and then took the pup out for potty in the back about maybe 20 minutes before the knocking began. It freaks me out a bit that I could have been outside or vulnerable if I had stayed up later like usual. Anyway, in the end nothing really bad happened to me which I'm grateful for but the whole situation was eerie and, I don't know, I just felt like someone was watching me the whole time. When I was really little, my mum was a paranormal investigator, so I pretty much grew up around ghosts and stuff like that. But flashback to when I was like in middle school, 
we moved into a house which was super exciting because pretty much all of my life before then I had been moving around from place to place, staying with people and never really having our own house. So 13, 14 year old me was super excited to have my own room. For a good couple of years nothing happened too, but then it started slow. Things flying off shelves, hearing footsteps down the hallway, stuff like that. But one night in particular has me almost traumatized for life, I think. I was sleeping when I had woken up to my dog growling, not like her at all, which was weird. She was staring at the closet. I didn't think much of it and brought her up to me trying to get her to stop. Then everything just goes really silent for not even a second when everything on my walls came crashing down all at once. Things that were tacked, nailed, screwed into the wall, didn't matter. Everything came down. I hid under my blanket and didn't really sleep for the night. When it was morning, I got up and everything was still on the ground, so I put it all back up. When I told my mum, she said that she didn't hear anything apparently, which blew my mind because it was so loud. That was really the only major thing that happened other than a, a few smaller occurrences, but man, it shook me up a lot and I slept with the light on for a good while after that too. So, I feel sort of silly even sharing this, because I am someone that is entertained by the paranormal. I find it fun and spooky, but I wouldn't say that I'm a believer per se. My belief is very fluid. Sometimes I think I believe and sometimes I'm a skeptic. Most of the time I'm a skeptic I think and I can think logically and explain things away. However, today I saw something with my own two eyes that I cannot explain. So basically my parents had taken my little girl for a walk to the park as I haven't been feeling very well lately. I've been quite dizzy and sickly for the last week or so, super super tired as well as I was glad for the break. They were gone for about an hour and I laid on my bed enjoying the peace and quiet. When they got home, we sat in the living room together just chatting. I was sitting on an armchair facing the window, my mum and my daughter and my dad were sitting on the couch under the window facing me. My dad though suddenly said that he felt funny and his vision had gone funny. This alarmed me, so I looked up to ask if he could be getting a migraine or something, when to the side of him, this long, white, almost string thing appeared. I really don't know how to describe it to do it justice, but it was the length of my upper torso. It wasn't see-through, but it wasn't exactly solid either. It was almost like smoke or liquid the way that it moved. It appeared by his head, and in shock I shouted, Dad! And to my surprise, he really calmly replied, I know, I see it too. This long hair-like smoke or fog string light thing moved from the side of his head around the front of his body and eventually disappeared between him and my daughter on the couch. Both myself and my dad were excitedly exclaiming, did you see that? Can you believe that? So we both definitely saw the same thing. It didn't move particularly quickly either, which was strange, but my mum had been sat beside my daughter the whole time, but didn't see anything apparently. Just to mention too, I'm not a smoker, nobody in my family smokes, there were no candles lit, no open windows, and I checked the sofa afterwards to see if there had been a cobweb falling or a stray hair or something, but there was nothing. To this day, I still have no idea what it was, but... Has anyone ever experienced something similar here? I'm finding it quite frustrating that I'm struggling to find the right words to describe this thing that materialized in front of me in broad daylight too. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of home, out of town, then rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had a lot of time on her hands and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying at this point. The woman, who literally had no life besides from trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing weird stuff though. 
Examples of this were things like, I woke up to find her watching me sleep, she stole my sunglasses at one point, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and in real life trolling a bit, though she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch and despite my interest in spirituality and tarot, I don't believe in witches or witchcraft. Anyway, I decided at this point that I'd had enough of tolerating her stuff and moved out. But that resulted in her stalking me via turning up to my workplaces and staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police and then she tried to cyberstalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it always disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. But eventually it started standing at the foot of my bed. Again, whenever I tried to get up or turn on the light, it would always vanish though. But one night, I woke up to it standing there like usual. But this time, I could see a creepy woman's face on it. And it was smiling at me. I said get lost and when I did, it vanished. For a while, I didn't see anything but... I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they had come from. I would find them on my arms, chest, hips and thighs. One night though I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something bit me to find scratches on my shoulder, back, like someone had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me and even visited a doctor who asked me if I was self-harming wasn't and couldn't figure out where these scratches were even coming from. The last incident though occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over to my side. I felt air on my face and originally I ignored it until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead looking woman. She looked wet like someone killed her and then left her in some water to rot or something. Her body was coming up out from underneath the bed while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed in horror and was too scared to get off the bed. I covered my face with the blanket and then started saying prayers and waiting until morning. Eventually the sun rose and I looked around the room but there was nothing. After that it never came back and the scratches they seemed to heal. It scares me to think about but... I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time or something and was scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I really don't believe in spells. Whatever it was, though, it wanted to pose as a female, I think, and it was a part of my loser ex-housemate, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something. And that's really all I can put it down to. Somehow, that woman, she managed to cause this. This happened uh, a couple of days ago. I live in the suburbs of Northern California with my parents in an upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, my parents are away for their anniversary so I've had the place to myself for the week. I got home from a late shift at work at around 1am. I go inside, shower, then I head to the kitchen to make some buffalo wings for dinner. I crack open a beer and I sit in front of the TV for a bit. I was sifting through movies to watch an HBO Plus when all of a sudden the doorbell rings. It actually startled me to the point that I had jumped off the couch knocking my beer over in the process. It's now 2am and there was really no good reason for anyone to be at the door at this hour. I just sort of stared in the direction of the front door for several seconds before it rang again followed by rapid knocking on the door and the window. Now. For whatever reason, I was no longer scared, but more annoyed at the fact that some idiot would think that it's appropriate to bang on someone's front door at this time of the night. I head over to the front door, unlock the deadbolt, and pull the front door open, leaving the chain in place. In the heat of the moment, I didn't think to look out the window first. I just sort of yanked the door open. Standing on the front porch was a woman around mid-twenties with long silky black hair and a purple hoodie with black pants. 
I said, Can I help you? To which she responded with, Oh, yeah. Sorry to bother you so late, but my boyfriend and I are having some car trouble and our phones are dead. We were wondering if you could possibly let us use yours. She pointed up the street to what looked like a dark-colored sedan parked underneath the street lamp and said, See, that's us right there. Now, had this been any other person, and I would have said no, but she looked, I don't know, innocent. Like she was a college student. I live in a college town. And it wasn't completely uncommon for college kids to be out late on a Friday night. I asked her where her boyfriend was, and she said that he walked to the gas station to see if anyone had a phone there. I pulled my iPhone out and told her to make it quick as I was about to go to bed. She thanked me and said that she'd only take two seconds. She took my phone, dialed a number, and put the phone up to her ear. After a couple of rings, whoever she called picked up, and she said, Uh, yeah, it's me. I'm borrowing someone's phone. She stopped talking, and I could barely make out a man's voice on the other end. It was around this point, too, that I started to feel uneasy. She was taking a, a lot longer to be done with the phone call, and... I started to get impatient. The whole time she just stood there staring at me with a wide-eyed expression and a creepy smile that looked forced while this person on the other end kept talking. She finally said, Oh, okay, bye, and handed me my phone back. She then said, uh, Do you think that I might be able to come inside to use your bathroom? I said no and wished her good luck before shutting the front door. And right as I was about to walk away, I began to hear her laugh and say, you made the right choice. I looked out the peephole and she was still standing on my porch, but now she had a man standing next to her. He looked to be around her age and was wearing a, a hoodie and also a face mask. The pair then started to circle around my house, banging on the windows and laughing. I didn't hesitate to call 911 at this point but they stuck around for several minutes trying to get in through my back door. I had my Glock 19 in hand aimed at the back door with 911 on speaker and was prepared to do whatever I had to do if they got in. They banged on my back door for around five minutes before they finally left. I watched them run up the street to that black sedan that I mentioned earlier and take off up the street. The cops showed up a few minutes later and they took a report. They told me that I was the third person to call them that night reporting a suspicious couple attempting to enter homes. I don't know what they had planned, but I'm inclined to believe that it was nothing good. Moral of the story is never answer the front door at 2am, especially without looking to see who it is first. I definitely learned my lesson that night. When I turned 18, me and my two other friends decided to take a trip to our local casino. We mostly just played simple games like slots and video roulette since it was our first time going to the casino. After losing some money, we decided to search for something to eat. Pretty much everything was way too overpriced, so we wandered around for quite a bit. Eventually, we reached a hallway along the border of the main floor. We made our way down the hall looking for food, but everything was closed. We started to notice that the hall was completely vacant of people though. As we wandered further down the hall, we reached a sort of oddly intriguing small room through a double doorway. This was the only entrance into this room. It was completely empty except for us three and about 10 to 20 slot machines, I would guess. But we were bored though, so I decided to throw five bucks into the slot machine and spin a few times. After my second or third spin, an odd-looking man, early to mid-thirties, just appeared from behind the slot machine, seemingly out of thin air. He began watching me play and started getting uncomfortably close to us. But we weren't very worried since we outnumbered him like three dudes to one. However, we were very confused. But we grew more and more uneasy the longer that we stood there, not saying a word. Eventually, my friend decided to ask him what's up. The man looked at us for a second before asking if we were all brothers. None of us looked even remotely similar, so we told him that we were just friends. 
he said, Oh, uh, that's great. And proceeded to ask if he could join our group. We told him that we all came together and lied in saying that we were actually planning on leaving soon. He told us that we should stay and play with him and says, My good friend Rachel over there knows all the good machines. And points to the other side of the room. We sort of slowly peer around the machine and all immediately become horrified. There was nobody else in the room with us. He was pointing into an empty corner. We all sort of stand up from our seats and slowly back out of the room, not letting our eyes leave this guy. Once he was out of sight, we turned around and sprinted down the hallway back to the main game room. We all vowed to never go back down that hallway ever again and I never did. But curiosity eventually got the better of us. Now, about a year and too many casino trips later, we're playing blackjack back at the same casino with a fourth friend. He gets bored and hungry and says that we should go look for some food. After walking around looking for food, we made it back to the entrance of that very hallway that we vowed never to return to. The fourth friend said that we should search down there for some food. The rest of us tell him no and explain to him that we can't go back down there. He asks why, so we tell him about the experience down that hallway one year prior. He believed that we were making it up and that there was no room or slot machines in the location that we described. He explains that mum was a worker at the casino and he would know if there was a rogue room of slots in the middle of nowhere. So we did the one thing that we could do to convince him of our experience. We decided to lead him to the room. We made our way down the hallway and searched for the room, but after walking for a few minutes, we reached the end of the hall. Confused, we turned around and searched again, thinking that we had somehow missed it, but no, there was no room. We came to the conclusion that they must have moved the machines out of the room since the casino changes things around quite frequently so people don't gain a sense of direction on the game floor. So we once again walked down the hallway in search of an empty room or at least a set of closed doors that would enter the room. But there was nothing. No doors even remotely close to where we remembered the room. We were completely dumbfounded and started to question our sanity after all this. But all three of us remembered the room in the same location, yet there was nothing. There was no room with slot machines. In fact, there was no room at all. To this day, neither me nor my friends understand or can explain how any of this happened. A couple of years ago, my buddy and I were bored one afternoon and we decided to explore an abandoned house that I had spotted earlier that week when I was out on a drive. We live in a town that is mostly suburbs but if you drive like 5 minutes north, it's all country roads, farmland, forest, etc. The abandoned house that I spotted was in the middle of a field. There wasn't a paved road or gravel driveway that led up to it. So we parked as close as we could on the side of the road and walked through the tall grass to reach it. The house looked pretty old, most likely built in the early 1900s. There were plants engulfing the entire home and part of the roof was missing from what looked like fire damage. It had obviously been abandoned for quite some time, but my friend told me that it was going to hang back when we came close to the house. He just couldn't shake the feeling that something was off and said that he was getting bad vibes from the place. I decided to keep going and when I reached the house I looked in through the windows and saw lots of weather damage and signs of neglect. The door however was still locked. I walked around the perimeter of the house and found a cellar door. It was unlocked. I entered and slowly started walking down an old wooden staircase. I got about halfway down I think and squinted waiting for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The only light source was the sunlight coming in from the open cellar door. It was full of old belongings, furniture and junk. But then, in the far right corner of the room, I saw what looked like a figure standing in the darkness facing me. My stomach sank when I saw the person. Whoever they were, they were tall and they were just standing there straight with their arms at their side. 
couldn't make out what they were wearing or any facial features, but I stood there for a few seconds staring back at them in shock. I thought that it had to be my mind playing tricks on me, so I sort of squinted harder trying to make out if what I was seeing was actually a tall figure, when suddenly it moved slightly and made a, a deep grunting sound. I panicked and I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. When my friend saw the look on my face when I exited the basement, he started running towards the car. He said that it looked like I had seen a ghost and when we drove away I kept looking back to see if we were being followed but thankfully there was nobody there. This is the story my aunt told me years ago. My aunt and her family lived in a very rural and backwoods area of Lincoln County, West Virginia. She said that her father would go fox hunting periodically. He and the other men would travel up into the mountains to their camp. There they would let their dogs run, chase foxes, and spend the evening talking and telling stories among themselves. My aunt had many siblings, which was not uncommon back in the 1950s, backwoods West Virginia. Her mother decided that she would walk with several of the younger children up to her husband's, my aunt's father's, camp. My aunt was one of the party and she said that they walked a long way back up on the mountain and spent a few hours relaxing and spending time with her dad. The group had such a nice time that they didn't realize it had gotten so late. My aunt's father gave his wife a lantern in order for her and the kids to be able to see on their long journey down the mountain. As the group left, the light from the fox hunters camp eventually faded out of sight. As they walked on down the mountain, her mother noticed a small ball of light about the size of a, a softball coming down the mountain behind them. Thinking that it was her husband needing something, she and the children stopped on the trail to wait. As they stood there, the light slowly made its way down the path and into better view. My aunt said though that the closer that it got, they could see that it wasn't actually a lantern at all, but a ball of light floating about three feet from the ground. She said that once her mother realized this, she put the children in front of her and told them to run as fast as they could down the old trail that was cut into the mountain. But my aunt told me that they all ran as fast as they could down the hill. She said that the faster they ran, the faster the ball of light moved. But my aunt said that they finally got to where their home was and ran inside and locked the door. According to my aunt, they were all terrified, and when they finally got the courage to look out the window, there was nothing there. So I've never really had a paranormal experience, which is why I've always erred on the side of skepticism, I think. But I just started to dog sit regularly, overnight stays and have stayed in three homes so far with no issue. I don't ever get scared on my own at night, and especially not when I have dogs with me. I also never have problems getting to sleep and staying asleep, even in places that are new to me. However, this day, I don't know, it was different from the jump. Typically, I get like 8 to 10 hours, but the first night, I got maybe at most 4. So far, I've always slept on the couch with a dim light on nearby, so I don't run into stuff if I have to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. I settle in at around 9pm this night because the dog that I'm sitting is a puppy and the owner told me that that's when he gets sleepy. I put my headphones in and settle in to watch a few episodes of Misfits until I'm tired enough to turn in. The dog lays down to sleep on my legs. Everything is typical of every house sitting that I've ever had so far. The only thing that I'm not used to though is this house has a, a walkway on the second floor looking down into the room that I'm sleeping in. I'm fine though. Like I said, I, I don't really get scared. So I go to sleep at around midnight. But the issues this night arose though when the dog woke me several times, barking at nothing. Each time this would happen too, I would settle him again, blame it on him sleeping in a different area and not being used to it and go back to sleep. It took longer each time, but I did it. Only, it got to the point that every time that I was on the cusp of sleeping, he'd bark or start growling. Finally though, I managed to fall asleep at around 3.30, only to wake up at 6.30 to 
the sound of voices talking, sounding like they were in the kitchen, the room over. My initial thought was it was the owners using the Furbo, like a baby monitor but for dogs, that's in there with the crate, because it sounded like it came from the same area. But that didn't make sense though because the dog was with me and it was 6.30 in the morning so I called it an auditory hallucination from lack of sleep and I just moved on. Now he's a pretty big puppy, a Vizsla, 45 pounds at 6 months, so I'm thinking maybe he needs more space on the couch. I switched to the pullout on the second night, I also put the lights that I dimmed in the kitchen to the max but it was the same. Go to sleep at 12.30, more on edge today, start clocking noises that I wasn't paying attention to yesterday, but sometimes it sounds like shuffling on the carpet on the second floor. Sometimes it's taps coming from the kitchen that I never hear during the day. I spend a significant amount of time squinting up the darkened walkway, but I don't see anything. But I have the weirdest feeling come over me. It just sort of feels like something is up there. The dog still barks sporadically, sometimes jerking awake because of it. I think that I get like three hours of sleep. I wake up again at 6.30 to voices, but they're closer this time, sounding like they're actually in the same room as I'm in. I'm like, okay, I definitely need more sleep if I'm having another auditory hallucination, so I drive home that day to nap for a few hours. Now, I feel like I have to clarify something at this point. Auditory hallucinations when waking up are rare, and I think that I've had them maybe five times max before this in my entire life that I can remember at least. So as much as I'm trying to gloss over it, it's definitely weird. So, on the third night, which was yesterday, I'm like, okay, it's probably just all in my head. Still, I keep the kitchen lights on max and this time I turn on the lights above the walkway. I get to sleep at 12.30. But then I'm startled awake two hours later when the dog freaks out, starts barking and growling facing towards the foyer on the other side of the staircase leading up the walkway. He then does something that he never did before this and runs into the foyer to see if something's there. I'm sitting there with my ears perked, my phone in one hand, wondering if I should call the police or not but... I don't hear anything and he comes back like 30 seconds later, standing on the pullout next to me and staring at the same place that he was earlier. I'm officially spooked at this point. I'm still hearing stuff. I still feel like something is watching me. I start counting the taps in the kitchen and it's always three sets of three which is comforting at first because I think it's an appliance. Except then I realize that I'm pretty sure that's a thing in the supernatural world and not a good thing, right? In any case, I, I get back to sleep at 5.30 in the morning. This time, though, I'm not woken at 6.30 by voices. Instead, at 7.30, a woman whispers my name directly into my ear, clear as day. I don't know if it's significant or if this happens in auditory hallucinations as well, but this time, it's only audible in my exposed ear since I'm sleeping on my side. Regardless, at this point, I'm done. I feed the dog, let him out, put him in his cage, drive home and sleep for four more hours. It's the fourth night now and currently midnight while I write this. I'm still hearing stuff around me even while I'm sitting here in the kitchen with a, a ton of lights turned on. Sometimes, I feel like I see things moving in my peripherals. I kind of feel like I'm going crazy to be honest. So I just want to, I don't know, share everything that's happening here. Maybe someone could explain some of this and relieve me of my fears or perhaps confirm them. I'll be up tonight I think and I don't plan on sleeping. So, I want to share a story of an old house that I lived in when I was younger. It's a bit of a long one, so do brace yourselves. We moved in there as a family, my parents, my brother and I, when I was around seven. It was a semi-detached UK house with two bedrooms and a loft. 
The bedroom my brother and I shared had access to the loft via a standard door and a staircase leading up to a large loft ensuite. My father used to sleep and work there before he moved out, as my parents were separated for a long time before their divorce. While he still lived there, however, I became accustomed to the sounds of him walking in the loft and down the stairs to me in my brother's bedroom. This is important for later, so keep that in mind. Again, I knew inside out what footsteps sounded like when someone was in the loft or walking down the stairs to the bedroom. So, before my father moved out, a lot of stuff happened between him and my mother. And it was around this time that I remember starting to feel a, a deeply troubling energy whenever I was in the house. After he had left, I still continued to hear the footsteps of someone pacing up and down the loft and sometimes even down the staircase to the door where my brother and my bedroom was. But my mother often got up there to use the ensuite, so there were many occasions where I heard the pacing and went up thinking that I'd find my mother there, but the loft would be empty. I also heard these footsteps a lot in the evenings, all the way from downstairs in the living room. They were always heavy and sometimes would slow down or speed up. I dreaded when my mother would send me up there to get some wrapping paper or something else. I distinctly remember walking up to the landing with the main bathroom, master bedroom and my bedroom while still hearing these footsteps going back and forth. I'd reach the attic door and the minute that I would open it, they would always stop. Sometimes when I felt brave, I'd do a sort of thorough check of the loft space and ensuite, again finding nobody there. This went on for months too, maybe even a year, and to add to the footsteps, the door which led to the loft began to sometimes open slightly and then slam shut. I put it down to the draft, despite no windows being open, and despite the force in which it would slam too. I also deeply considered that an eight-year-old was going crazy at the time. I thought maybe the divorce and the negative experiences in the house were making me see and hear things and I was resolved to confide in my mother for help, which I didn't. But one day though, my mother wanted to go for food shopping. There was a safe way about a 40 minute walk away from the house, but on that specific day, I was too tired to do the 40 minute walk and threw a tantrum adamant that I was going to stay home by myself. My brother and my mum left and I sat down on the sofa to watch some TV. The sofa was against the wall of the staircase leading up to the landing with the bedrooms. After about 20 minutes I began to hear the footsteps pacing in the loft and started getting spooked. I remember thinking, it's all good, they'll stop soon or if they don't nothing bad will happen, there's nothing up there. And then they started coming down the loft stairs. At this point, I turned the TV volume way up. I consoled myself with the idea that this was just a usual thing and I remember telling myself, it's okay, they'll stay there. But this time, they didn't. I started hearing them heavier, walking across my room. That feeling too, I'll never forget it, was like absolute horror. Like someone was up there and now knew that I was alone. Again though, I thought, okay, as long as they stay a floor above, I'll be good. I calculated in my head that the steps should have reached the top of the staircase leading to my floor by now. I held my breath, heard nothing, and was about to dismiss it all as just stupidity. But then, it started walking slowly but loudly down the stairs just behind me. Now, to the right of me was the door entering the living room, and I made the decision that I was not going to look, because there was definitely something there, and I could hear that there was something there. I started singing to myself, I know, sort of ridiculous, but remember, I was eight years old. I sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star so loudly over and over again, and to be honest, I don't really remember too much after that, apart from hearing a knock at the door after what felt like literally only a minute. Even though my brother and my mother were probably like only halfway to the Safeway and then opening it to see both my mother and brother back from the shopping. That was really strange too. It was almost like, I don't know, time had just gone fast or something. The footsteps continued after that though like they did before this day as well as the door slamming. I never told anyone and we moved shortly after. 
I never brought it up again until I was about 11, but by then I had chalked these events down to my life at that house having a negative effect on my mental health. But my brother and I had gone to dinner with my dad at Pizza Express and we must have been talking spooky things at some point. I thought, uh, why don't I just tell them what I experienced in the house? I told the story in a brief way with not much detail and I look up to see my brother literally go pale. All he said was, I heard them too, and he went on to describe the sound, the speed, the heaviness of the footsteps, the change of the direction, the door slamming, all of it. My father suggested that it was the neighbors due to the house being semi-detached, but even as an eight-year-old, I was thorough. I made sure at the time that I could differentiate from the sounds. I often heard the neighbors running or going up and down the stairs, and that just definitely wasn't this. Whatever this was, it was different. This happened when I was 17 years old. I'm 20 now. I'm from Bosnia and I used to go fishing with my friends whenever I could. When the summer break began, we used to explore many rivers. Usually we would encounter animals or people, but nothing special. Keep in mind too that legal driving age in Bosnia is 18, so we would usually take a bus to a location or just walk it. One night though, me and my friends sat on a bus and went to a city not too far away. I won't tell you the name because it's a small country and I've always had a bit of a phobia of someone from the internet finding me. But anyways, we arrived and before exiting the bus, an old creepy drunk guy said something along the lines of, you boys going fishing? To which I replied, yeah, in the lake, and I gave the name. He added, well, good luck then, I hope you catch some fish, with a really creepy laugh tacked on at the end. We arrived at the lake, which was very beautiful, and we started fishing. At around 1.30, after we had had some beers, we could hear arguing in the distance. One of my friends took a flashlight and shined it into the distance, and... As he went over a bush, somebody clearly was crouching down in it. As there were many of us, we weren't really too scared. Me and the friend with the flashlight went to investigate it while the others stayed near the campfire. Upon arriving to the bush, we spotted the same old drunk guy crawling in the grass. We asked him what he was doing, to which he replied that he was hunting. We didn't see any weapon on him whatsoever, so I proceeded to ask him, what are you hunting without a weapon for? He got up and said, look, this is a coincidence, I'm going to get going, while sort of stumbling away. We returned and we tried to enjoy the rest of the night. At around 4am we heard somebody angrily shouting in the distance again. When we turned around to spot this buff guy in a black shirt covered in tattoos. And behind him was the old guy. What do you think you're doing on my property, he said to us. So we were fishing and we didn't know this property was yours. In the argument, I could see my friends packing the fishing rods and all the things that we brought. My friends made a run for it to the forest, leaving me and my other friend there. Okay, you're going to call your friends and tell them to come back or else you're not leaving, says the buff guy. I, of course, didn't want to do that as I did nothing wrong. We were quiet, just sort of talking, doing nothing to disturb anyone, and plus the river was like 300 meters away from any houses. My friend tells the man that we're going and starts to walk. But this is where it gets scary. The dude grabs my friend by the neck and starts arguing with him. I jumped in and hit the guy in the face and started running towards the road. He lets go of my friend and chases after me. And after running for about a minute, the dude gets tired. I end up exiting the trees and go onto the street. I wait on a bench for some time and see my friend coming. He sits next to me and tells me that when the dude started chasing me, the old guy jumped on him with a hunting knife. He thankfully missed my friend and he ended up pushing the dude and running as well. We called the cops after that, obviously. A patrol came and we gave our statement. We called our other friends and ended up meeting up with them. The cops explained to us that the part where we had apparently been was private property, but again, the fact that the guy grabbed my friend by the neck was not how he should have reacted. We ended up going home, and nowadays we just sort of laugh at this story, but to be honest, it was a really close call.